I can't believe I'm in Boston on St. Patrick's Day and I'm not wearing green. <laughs> I think it may be against some law and I'm really sorry. <laughs> I packed without thinking. Uh, it's fabulous to be here and um, I've, I've been looking forward to this day for many, many months since uh, Melinda invited me to come uh, because uh, I love Boston. I love the opportunity to see Barbara and, and friends here. And, and then the the topic was so inviting um, to talk about spirituality in the home and family because um, that is my great love. Uh, both as um, a, a person of, who has worked in various areas of ministry, but also as a mother, a daughter, a sister. <laughs> um, family is, uh, is so important to me. And um, so I... Um, I always gravitate to invitations that invite me to speak about spirituality in real life situations. And I always like to learn a little bit about uh, the folks that I'm with, and because we don't have time to go around and invite all of us to share our family stories, I would like to learn a little bit about you. So I have a family quiz, um, and so if this, um, the, I'm going to read a number of statements. If these describe you, please stand, okay? Just stand up and then we'll sit down and go to the next one, okay? And I work full time. They're going, I don't know whether I work full time. <laughs> I'm a grandparent. Boy, they stand up right away. And they all have pictures to prove it, I'm sure. I'm the New England Patriots. <laughs> One child. Okay. Oh. All right. I play a musical instrument. Past month. Okay. I am the oldest child in my family. They're very responsible and standing up. <laughs> um, I take time each day to do something I enjoy. <laughs> but I do. Uh, I know how to send a text message. <laughs> Congratulations, I don't. Um, I speak more than one language. People, oh, fabulous. I watched the debates during the presidential campaign. Okay. I am an only child. Only child? Okay. I have a pet dog. I have a child younger than um, age 10, which may be equivalent to having a. <laughs> I have watched an episode of. An idol. <laughs> Some of us don't want to admit that. I am the youngest child in my family. Okay. I like mushrooms on my pizza. I am a morning person. <laughs> okay. I have an unusual pet. No unusual pets. Okay. You should get at least one person that has a lizard or something. Um, I am the best looking in my family. Oh, oh come on. Yes. <laughs> I am a child of God. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for. Um, now, believe it or not, uh, that. That little quiz tells us a lot about who we are, with you know, placement within our family, a little bit about our family stories. Um, there's a lot of things that surface in a, a quiz like this. How many of you are in parish ministry? 
uh, in some sense. This is a wonderful thing to do with parents. Without putting them on the spot, you can learn a lot <laughs> uh, with the kind of questions because there's interests, there's routines, there's preferences, there's family of origin uh, information as well as nuclear family information. It's a simple way uh, to name some of our commonalities as well as our individualities uh, within our spirituality. And the latter is a little bit more shaded. Uh, when, when Melinda invited me to come um, and talking about a topic and a title, um, I suggested to her that we, we take the image of the garden, and she immediately responded to that. A garden of grace. Um, and the reason I was so uh, drawn to that was um, I grew up in Denver. I'm a native of Denver and um, very rooted in Denver. My grandmother was born in Denver in 1876, and she lived on the street from Molly Brown. And so uh, I know Colorado history uh, through my grandmother's stories, not through Debbie Reynolds dancing on a tabletop story of Molly Brown. <laughs> and um, I lived uh, on, we lived, my family lived on a street called Ivy Lane. <laughs> And it's as beautiful, it was as beautiful as it sounds, the house. My parents built it before World War II, and it was really a work of love uh, for them uh, and the six of us that grew up there. It was very formative for me, that home, um, personally, and as I view the domestic church. Because in the, uh, around the house, my mother had, she was a wonderful gardener, and she planted a beautiful um, rose garden. This is a picture here of, if this works. Oh, we froze up. Shoot. I'm hoping this will work. <laughs> oh, there we are. This is a picture of the rose garden in Portland, Oregon, if you've ever been to Portland. And I'm, it's not quite what my mom's garden looked like. <laughs> Uh, but mom uh, planted a beautiful rose garden, and I used to love to watch it bloom every year. Um, because I think gardens are very, uh, they're very evocative images of, of spirituality. Uh, Wendy Wright, writing in the uh, spiritual journal Weavings, describes gardens as a material reminder that Eden is where our story began and where it will end. In our gardens, we fashion our best selves, our creativity bent toward shaping and tending the natural world into a place of graciousness and grace. In our gardens, we remember those with whom we knew that faith, hope, and love are tangible realities and with whom we realize something of the garden that might be. A garden is an intentional, sacred environment a place where what is most ordinary, human, and earthy gains depth, resonance, and soul. So that image of garden as a sacred place, as well as an ordinary human one, makes it a great metaphor for the home as a place where faith is seated and spirituality grows. So it's an image that I'd like to draw upon as we move through the morning. And uh, before we do, um, I want to just add a little caveat about the word family. <laughs> um, because within the garden metaphor, there's the other one, and that is the family tree. And we, you know, we're all pretty familiar with that idea of the tree that has roots, it has a trunk, branches, leaves, um, odd little growths. It's a wonderful image for family, you know that grows kind of all over the place. Um, and so it, when I talk about family, I hope that you will keep in mind that broad image of family as an extended unit that goes back generations. Um, it includes parents and children, to be sure, but also other configurations of family, married couples um, with or without children, people who have never been married, divorced or single people, full, empty, or partial nest or boomerang families. Any of you a boomerang family? You had a child you thought you launched, and whoops, they, here they come back, <laughs> back home again. Um, so it's a very broad 
uh, term. And so I'll be referring both to our nuclear family, whoever that is, you know, that we're living with now. Some of you may be in religious communities and you consider that your family uh, right now, as well as our family of origin. And we'll go back and forth into that. And then another aspect of the title that I'd like to just draw upon is that whole image of the Garden of Grace. Um, I grew up uh, in, went to school in pre-Vatican II days, and some of you may remember the old Baltimore Catechism illustration of grace. Do you remember the milk bottles? Uh, <laughs> and it, we learned, you know, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, we kind of learned that when, you, you know, we were like a milk bottle full of sanctifying grace. And then when we sinned, the, the grace level dipped down. Then you went to confession and it went back up, and it was kind of up and down. It was one of those images that really took hold <laughs> as children. Um, and I think better than a milk bottle, grace to me might be described as juice. You know? it's, it's the juice, really, of our soul. John McGabgab, in uh, another article of Weavings, defines grace as the continuously and outflowing energy of God's love in which all creatures live and without which we cannot thrive. Grace permits us to see God's luminous purpose shining in creation, and grace creates within us the very capacity for such vision. I love that because it, it speaks of grace as really active, um, not something that you know, diminishes necessarily, but is all around us uh, if we have the eyes and the ears uh, and the heart to see and to accept it. So I want to look at how grace flows in and out of family spirituality that may not always be um, apparent on the surface. And so we're going to go through today um, and look at five spiritual practices uh, which you have on an outline on your green sheet. And that's just, you know, for your chronic note takers, <laughs> those who just love, you know, bullet statements. And it's like, I didn't get that fifth one. I, put, I tried to put them into the... Um, into the outline. And we're going to look at um, these practices, this, the art of storytelling, the celebration of ritual, the extension of forgiveness, the cultivation of gratitude, and the stewardship of resources. And hopefully get all of that done by 12.15 today. Um, so, and then we'll go off to lunch and continue to enjoy uh, one another's company. Okay? So, um, Let's get started, and, and we'll start with um, storytelling. Do you have a favorite story about your family? What comes to mind when you hear that? A favorite story about my family? It could be the, your, your nuclear or your family of origin. And what I'd like you to do is just for a minute, just talk to your neighbor about a favorite story. Anything that comes to mind, okay? It sounds like you found some stories to tell. Anybody totally stumped? Like, we have no stories in our family. <laughs> um, anybody find, did you find it easy to kind of latch on to one? And then, what happened when you started hearing another person's story? It clicks. Okay, you found some commonalities. That's what story, good stories do. We start to tell, you know, yeah, I remember, and that happened in my family, and this is how we handled it. And uh, storytelling in families is so important, and it goes on all the time. Um, uh, I, I think it's, you know, and it's central to our, the foundation of our faith and certainly the foundation of families. For thousands of years, we've used stories to talk about God and to understand our relationship with God. The Bible is filled with stories about families, isn't it? Uh, some of them you wouldn't necessarily want living next door to you. Uh, and as Wendy Wright points out, the story of the Garden of Eden is, a st is the story of where we first began. And it begins with a family. You know, and you can look at that family and say, geez, my family doesn't look so weird. You know, <laughs> in the Jerome Biblical Commentary, it talks about Genesis, uh, the book of Genesis, as a book concerned with origins of the world, of human beings, of Israel and its ancestors, 
In Mesopotamian culture, it says, scribes explored beginnings through stories, not through abstract reasoning. And that is very significant if, we're ten if we tend to think, well, it's just a story. Ah, it's, but what a story. Um, biblical sto families, too, are not the happy-go-lucky families, the Ozzy and Harriet families. Some of them would probably be too far out to be on Jerry Springer's show. Think about it. I don't know that he's ever had a, a family where a brother sold another brother into slavery. I, I just don't think that one's come up yet. <laughs> and yet you look at um, Jacob's family. Talk about a family in need of some massive counseling. You know. And a dominant thread in so many of these stories is the constancy of God's presence, the covenant, guiding us and loving us throughout history. And it's the same in family life if we keep going deeper into our family stories. Um, and there are many different types of stories that we tell in families, and I, I could do a whole day just on this. But I want to look at three of them. One of the most um, uh, typical ways that we tell stories is through memories. How many of you drew upon a memory when you thought of your, your family story? OK. Remember the time. Um, and we draw upon family uh, stories or memory stories often during family transitions. Would you agree? Weddings, funerals, those are times to start to remember. Uh, remember when you were little? or remember when this happened, um, around seasons, funerals, births, deaths, family gatherings, and holidays. Every Thanksgiving, my family t uh, takes out the story of the year the turkey fell off the platter in the kitchen. And my mother said, the floor is clean, and picked it up, threw it back on the platter, and we went on. <laughs> and, um, you know, it always brings about uh, more stories about mom and her very kind of unusual ways of storing food. Um, the telling of these stories brings a lot of comfort and healing. They bring us a better glimpse of the people who have guided, inspired, and influence, influenced us. And sometimes those are negative memories. They're not always happy memories. They're stories that get told over and over again, sometimes ranging into the area of myth. Have you ever listened to a family member tell a story and you're sitting there thinking, that didn't happen. I was, that did not happen that way. I'm sorry, I was there. You know, my brother told a story about, we had five crab apple trees in our garden. And, you know, crab, I don't, do crab apples grow out here? They're wonderful in um, late summer. When you throw them against the wall, they make a great splatting sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, Ted um, uh, calls it, his, he even has a name for this story, the great crab apple melee, <laughs> when the entire neighborhood came, according to him, and had a crab apple fight in our yard, and they even went into the house. And every time I hear this story, the cast is bigger, <laughs> and we have more trees, and it's more dramatic, you know, and it's somehow, and it's like, it's part of a memory, and at, at the heart of the memory uh, story is some lesson. And in that story, it's always that my mother came home and found all these kids running amok around our yard, and, and she was with a friend who said, I'd kill every one of them. And mom said, they're just being kids. And when we hear the story, we talk about mom's in, incredible patience uh, with us and our antics. And a lot of times, stories have that kind of uh, message behind them. Another kind of story is ancestral stories. Uh, something that was given a great boost uh, by the late uh, Alex Haley when he wrote the book Roots. And then that you know, became a miniseries. And, and certainly for African Americans, what an incredible story that was because these are people that were pulled away from their roots. Their stories were stolen from them. Their names were stolen from them. And this was a beautiful book and example of reclaiming those roots. And, and stories. And it, what it set off, I think, that is still going on is a tremendous interest in genealogy, uh, where many of us find that stories of our own ancestors got lost in the great melting pot of America. 
because many immigrants came here and they purposely left their stories behind. Uh, today being St. Patrick's Day, um, the Irish, of course, have so many tender stories. Uh, and, and when you go to Ireland, how many of you have been to Ireland? You know, they're constantly telling their stories. But one of the most striking ones to me is that when uh, people emigrated to America, a lot of times they would go down to the pier with their families and they would sing a song that was basically a funeral dirge because they knew they would never see them again. And, uh, so some of us found that we don't know our ancestors' stories. There is so much value in learning these stories because they're rooted, um, you know, our stories of our ancestors are sometimes rooted deep in spiritual uh, disciplines and religious traditions. Passing on a genealogy was a way some of the evangelists told Jesus' story. He comes from a family, and here's his family tree. And then it's painted in, in, in uh, colors and hues and textures that say this is a story of faith. Uh, and then the last uh, one that I'd, I'd like to look at is ghost stories. <laughs> the stories that haunt us in families. Uh, there are some questions that would not be appropriate to put on a family quiz, such as, there's an alcoholic in my family. Um, someone in my family committed suicide. Uh, dark stories, what we call skeletons in the closet. You know, when they say you're doing your genealogical studies, be aware. You may find, you know, your ancestor was not <laughs> all who you want to find out about. But what these dark stories tell us is they shed light on our failings, our losses, our grief, and our disappointments. These are stories that have to be told carefully. Sometimes these stories need to be held at certain times. Children, for example, do not need to know every detail of the story of their parents' painful divorce until they're old enough to handle a story, and maybe even then some of those details can't be passed on. Right? Now that's not to say, in, in some, story, some families we take it to uh, the absolute extreme, as my good friend and colleague Dolores Curran uh, family denial stories, you know, Uncle Henry doesn't drink, he just shakes, you know. <laughs> and we found certainly through our, uh, you know, in recent day, um, years and decades in looking at codependency in families and, and history of addiction, how important it is that we know some of those stories. You know, histories of depression, for example, that run in families because it's, we know that's part of our genetic code. Um, so those are interesting stories. And then different ways that we tell stories. Uh, the first is oral tradition. Stories in the Bible we know were passed down from one generation to the next long before written down, being written down. Think about the story you just told to, uh, to someone in here. Who told you that story? Where did you learn that story? What's the origin? All of our stories have some kind of a beginning, and yet generally it's passing down. There is such an importance of telling stories, even when children appear to be bored with them. I know, and I don't know about you, but you know, in my family, we, we do get around to the same stories. My husband just like, oh, no, your family, you know, you have to do this one more time. You know? And yet it's important. Because, uh, especially when, when kids start to balk at it, you know, uh, because somewhere along the way that story lodges, and someday it starts to emerge and it starts to make sense to us. Um, so that, that is really important. Uh, in her book, Sacred Time, Ursula Hege has this wonderful description of how family storytelling takes place in an oral tradition. She says, we all sat around and told stories the way we always did, with great passion. Listening with equally great passion while one of us would take one thread of the story and spin it along. And the listening would evoke further memories, so that with laughter or tears we'd leap into a story and become part of its weave. It was best when the stories were already familiar, 
because then we could take delight in how they change and yet stayed the same with each telling. And as we urged each other on, I felt the presence of untold stories, those all, already beyond all of us in the future, shaping themselves within the body of my family, waiting for us to live these stories and then to tell them. I love that description because what she's saying is we take that thread and we spin it out and we create a great myth. <laughs> and that is really, it's one of the reasons though, uh, I so appreciate uh, the Roman Catholic way of looking at, and in so many other religious traditions, of looking at the Bible, not literally and saying this is the only way to tell the story and the only way to hear the story but that we understand that these stories were passed on. And if we ever wanted proof that what, what's actually written down in the Bible is may not be exactly what happened, all we have to do is think about our crabapple melee stories in our family. <laughs> Look at how they get spun and told and retold and expanded upon. Because we draw out of sacred meaning. And so we do this in our church. We tell our stories over and over again. We're in the midst of a sacred season where we're telling stories about um, Jesus in the desert, you know, the woman at the well, the man being healed from his blindness. We're, getting, we're building up to the great, great story of Easter. And so the telling and the retelling of it makes sense in different ways each time we hear it. My son Eric said to me one Christmas, when he was about 10 years old, do we have to go to church this year? I've heard that story before. <laughs> That's not a bad question from a 10-year-old. If you're 40 and asking that question, I'm a little, a little concerned. But uh, it was a wonderful little entree for me as a catechist to come in and, you know, my little teachable moment. And I said, yes, we have heard that story before. And each time we hear it, it means something more. It means something different. And that's the beauty of our liturgical cycle and our lectionary in retelling our stories. Well, children are never going to understand that if they don't hear their own stories. And sad to say, so many of us know more about the story of Britney Spears' life than we do our own family stories. You know? We're spending a lot of time watching other people's stories instead of hearing and listening to our own. And then there's another way we tell stories. How many of you used a kind of a symbol or told a story about something in your family that reminded you of something? Did anybody come up with an association story? Because those are wonderful ways to tell stories. One of my favorite family stories has to do with a set of blue mirrors uh, that my brothers almost threw out when we were cleaning up my mom's house after my dad died. Um, the blue mirrors were what my mom used to put on... Um, up on a mantle at Christmas time, and she, there were this this beautiful set of mirrors, and then she would put little angel figures on them and make it into like a little skating rink for Christmas. Well, when Ted and Larry nearly threw these blue mirrors out, my sisters and I went apoplectic. My sister Crin comes running out of the house. She goes, "They are out of control. They're throwing everything out. I can't take this," you know. <laughs> And, we, you know, and Ted and Larry were genuinely perplexed. They said, these mirrors, they're kind of cracked, they're darkened, they don't... But they're the blue mirrors, you know? And they still don't quite get the significance of the blue mirrors. This is the difference between sometimes how women tell stories and how men tell stories. But when we start to talk about the blue mirrors, then we start to associate, again, family celebrations of Christmas, what those symbols mean. And that's why when you get to a point in your family where it's time to divvy up things, and we say, well, they shouldn't matter, but they do. Who gets that vase, <laughs> you know, that ugly vase that nobody even looked at for years and years, but we've got an association with it, and somehow it becomes precious. Um, it's the same in our church. Any of you who work in a, in, a, in a parish or a church situation know what that's like. That if you move a statue in the church, it could get you shot. You know? Because it has significance for people. Uh, and so we start to tell stories around that. Um, 
Our, now, what do stories do for us and why they matter? Well, they teach us about life and they teach us about faith. There's generally some kind of moral to every story in some way. In her book, Thin Places, um, Anne, Anne Ambrecht, who went to Nepal as part of her graduate studies as an anthropological student, talked about the importance of stories among the people that she was with. Stories, she says, are the one way, perhaps the most important way we make sense of our lives. They are what we tell ourselves and others about who we are and what we want, about where we are going and why. They provide a fixed point, a secure place from which we can step into the world. It's important to know our stories. They also connect us with something larger than ourselves, our nuclear and our extended families, our ancestors, and the world at large. It's wonderful to watch the dynamics in the room when you were telling your stories. Because what I could see happening was this vibrant kind of, oh yeah, you know, when we start to relate to one another, connect in some way. They help us understand how and why we've been raised in the way that we have. In her book, Motherline, Naomi Ruth Lewinsky talks about the importance of women knowing their mothers and fathers' stories. I think the same is true for men to know those stories. And she talks about the way we hear them at different points in our lives. Stories, she says, from the middle of life are different from those that begin at the beginning or begin at the end. From a midlife perspective, something new opens up a view from a mountain where one can see in all directions, a vantage point from which one can see forward in time while also seeing backward in time. Stories from the middle of a life involve an intense layering of experience that allows us to understand where we have been going from looking back at where we have been and where our mothers have been. My husband's father died when Ron was only 27. And he started to, to talk about how he wished he'd known more of his father's stories as he reached midlife, as Ron reached midlife. And I think it's partly this, was what did my dad experience? Why did he leave home so early to join the Navy? You know, what were the, what were the links in his, in his life? Um, that questions that he didn't ask when he was in his 20s and 30s became more important um, as he entered uh, midlife. Stories also speak to us about belonging to family, origin, uh, a family of origin or nuclear extended, and then to the human family. They root us in a bigger picture, which is why our stories um, are so important in uh, the process of baptism. You know, because baptism is that sacrament of belonging. And we pass on our stories to our children in our faith. Stories also illustrate what is valuable to us. Uh, the telling then becomes sacred. They provide a bridge to understanding others. There are certain universal stories bind us together, and I'm going to talk a little bit uh, when we talk about forgiveness, about a universal story that Jesus told that stays so contemporary, and it's rooted in family. Um, and then I think, two stories stand the test of time. They continue to be written long past the time we think they may have ended, including our own stories. Um, as a spiritual director, I teach in a spiritual direction program in Denver for the Benedictine uh, sisters run a, a program of Benedictine spirituality. And one of the assignments for the students is to write a spiritual autobiography. Uh, and one young man said to me in class, um, I'd rather scrub toilets than write, <laughs> quite honestly. Even though he was very eloquent. But somehow telling their own stories was such a daunting sort of thing. They do, they do it in four parts over the course of a year. And yet what is so incredible uh, is the strands of their stories that, that come out and how, you know, what an important part of, of spiritual formation that is, is to tell our own story. And you begin to see over that course of the, the two-year uh, spiritual formation program how important it is for these folks to know their own story, to reflect back on it, and you begin to see how we're still making sense of it. It isn't totally written. 
You know, the period isn't on the end of the sentence. I just had an experience of this traveling uh, around the country for a year with my husband and meeting cousins that I hadn't seen in 40 years. Uh, and we have an Aunt Ginny who died of a drug overdose when we were all children. And all of us have a different rendition of her story. Um, you know, my always told us it was an accidental drug overdose. My cousins understood it as a suicide. And so what is Aunt Ginny's story? It's a big question in our lives. What we know is that she um, And yet there is something to that story that just keeps um, evolving and that it, it speaks to us in some way. Um, and so if we pay attention, we start to see in our stories is the story of God's love that unfolds as we grow if we pay attention. Walter Bergman um, is a Hebrew scripture scholar, and he understands the Bible as a book of stories that draw the reader into the history of God's activity in the world. He ex emphasizes the need for parents and for extended family members, as well as religious leaders, to help children embrace their stories of their faith tradition. So, as he says, they can affirm that this is my story about me, and it is our story about us. And he goes through five aspects of what he calls story linking with children. The first thing he says children need is receiving the spiritual story of love and redemption through the care of their parents and the faith community. You know, that story that you are loved. You know. Um, and, and think of the children that don't hear that story. You know, if they don't hear it in their family, how is our church extending that story to them? They need to hear the story of the spiritual tradition in connection with stories of daily life. I once wrote a talk called Everything I Know About the Mass I Learned from My Mother. Because mom really did teach me through our family gatherings and dinners the flow of literature. You know, we were a very highly ritualized family. And I, I came to understand that um, later in life, how influential that was for me, understanding the sacramental flow through the way our family gathered and ate meals together. Children need those connections with ordinary life. Um, and what better place to do that but the family? Children, he says, need to celebrate the story of faith through special holidays and acts of charity and compassion. You know, not just hearing the stories, but living the stories, celebrating the stories. Uh, children also need to tell their stories. They need to tell them in their own words, both to others and to God in prayer. It's one of the most delightful things um, that I, I love about being catechist is listening to children interpret the stories. You know, and they interpret them in their own way. I remember watching um, uh, the movie Ben-Hur uh, with my daughter Anna when she was in preschool, and she was trying very hard to figure out who Pontius Pilate was, and she turned to me and she said, Mom, they didn't like what Jesus did, but they punched his pilot. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a vision of some little guy in goggles being pummeled <laughs> in the background. But they make, you know, they make sense of it in their own way, and then they retell it. And then children need to, as he says, I love this, become history makers. People whose words and actions contribute to a more just and compassionate society and encourage others to do the same. It's a wonderful thing to be empowered by our stories of faith. Um, I remember in, in second grade learning that, you know, we could, any Catholic could baptize under certain conditions. I was so empowered. I was waiting. Now, it's horrible, but I was waiting for the car, you know, and then there I would be. I don't know why I'd be standing there by myself. By the, and someone, is there a Catholic? Is there a Catholic here who can baptize? And I would say, yes, I would do this. I felt so empowered by that, that idea that I could contribute in some way. Happily, I was never on the scene of an accident where <laughs> that happened. And yet, I think there's always that sense that I am part of that story. Um, children are overwhelmed by bad news. They have access to it to a way today that I never did, that, that all of us never did. 
through uh, cell phones, through internet, through all this sort of thing, that they're hearing bad news all the time. We need to be giving them hopeful news as to how they are part of this story and that they can contribute in some way. Okay? Um, just Let me just uh, stop there before we go on to the next spiritual practice and just ask if you have any comments, thoughts, questions on stories. Okay, yes. Right. Um, how do you begin when families don't have the tradition of storytelling? And that is a very good question. I gave a talk a few weeks ago at a parish of, um, it was to a group of parents of adolescents. And a father came up to me afterwards and asked the same question. And he said, we don't tell stories. And I said, well, you probably do, but you're probably not aware of it. So one of the things, I think, is to help people start to become aware of the storytelling process. I mean, we're always telling stories about what we're doing. Uh, you know, the idea of it being a ritual sort of thing may, may be a stumbling block for people. But every time we tell a memory story, for example, and that's why I use different um, ideas about, you know, what do you remember about Christmas? What is, you know, or just what I asked you, tell a favorite story about your, your family. Invite parents and children into that process. Look at how quickly we came up with stories. And I would imagine some of you came from families where storytelling maybe doesn't seem like it was a front and center. And yet every family has stories. So to talk about um, associations, what's a favorite, you know, one of, the, one of the occasions for great storytelling is every year we set up a Christmas tree, you know. Where did this ornament come from, you know. Um, year, my daughter said to me one year, it seems to be a tradition every year we have a fight over who's going to hand, uh, you know, hang up the first ornament. I said, well, that's a lovely tradition. <laughs> but, you know, she came to me in her 20s and said, Tell me the stories about these ornaments because I need to pass them on. I said, oh my God, do you mean that? Because she used to groan and moan when I would, you know, this was an ornament that, you know. <laughs> so just ordinary sort of things, I think, is what draws people into stories. And then as, as parish leaders and catechetical leaders, look at how you can incorporate storytelling processes into your programs. Sacraments are a great opportunity for that. Okay, and look at those, those connections between sacraments and seasons. Okay, does that help? All right. Someone else had a comment? Yes. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Yes. Okay. Every question in Slumdog Millionaire led to a story. Wonderful. And that's another example. I think media has an awful lot of opportunities for families to tell stories about themselves. Like I said, we often know stories more about the media. Of I don't know why this keeps slipping out. Is it because where I'm standing? I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, anyway. Uh, Media often has it, if, if we are attentive to it, to start remembering through, you know, something like that, an association or jumping off point in, in, a, in a program or a story, okay? Um, how are you doing? Do you need a stand-up break? Do you need a break right now or can we go on to the next practice? And, okay. We'll go through this one and then we'll take a little break. The second spiritual practice is the this, this celebration of ritual. Uh, I have three sisters, and um, all four of us girls uh, opted to have our wedding receptions at my parents' homes. Um, Ivy Lane, as I said, had a big garden. Um, it, was, it was a beautiful place for us to celebrate our weddings. And it seemed that um, when 
back and then I think, it, it, especially when I look at the elaborate celebration of weddings today that is completely disproportional to what the sacrament of marriage means, I think that um, we, at some intuitive level, understood that this was a wonderful surrounding and environment for us to celebrate um, our, our marriages. And so, when you think about rituals that take place in gardens, garden parties, you know, um, uh, there's, there's wonderful sorts of things that happen in ritual. There was a great little television program on... Um, <laughs> uh, and a few, uh, it was, my well, gosh, it's been over 10 years now, called Brooklyn Bridge. Do any of you remember that great little song? It's very long, but it was cute. It was about an extended family that lived in Brooklyn, New York. Grandparents lived up above in an apartment, and then the parents lived with their two sons uh, in the apartment below them, and it took place in the 1950s. And um, the grandparents were Russian immigrants. And in one episode, uh, the grandmother's brother died, who had been estranged from the entire family, Uncle Leo. And um, the 13-year-old the boy in the show had just won tickets to the Brooklyn Dodgers baseball game. And, of course, the funeral of Uncle Leo is going to coincide with the game. So he and his grandmother have a big showdown over his obligation to go to the funeral because she wants him to be there they're Jewish, so she, she wants them to be sing that ritual with the, you know, enchant the ritual with the other males in the family. And he's determined he's going to go to the Brooklyn Dodgers game. And in one of the most classic scenes I've ever seen about family in the show, they square off with one another, and she uh, we're family, you know, and you're going to come to this. And he says, why? Nobody liked Uncle Leo. And she says, because we're family. And families are people who don't like each other coming together to do what they don't want to do. <laughs> I love that. It's such a wonderful description of ritual. Can you relate? Are there rituals in your family that nobody likes, but you just keep doing them anyway? It's like, why do we keep making this? You know, fruitcake at Christmas, nobody eats it, nobody likes it. Um, and I think that's a wonderful example. I remember uh, when it, it came out, that show came out not long after the bishops released their document, A Family Perspective in Church and Society. They had a wonderful definition of family, uh, you know, as you know, people who are bond together by marriage, blood marriage or adoption for the whole of life. But I thought, you know, that description would have been good too. People who don't like each other come together to do what they don't like to do. Uh, what, um, when we talk about, well, first of all, let me just go back to that. Uh, what ritual do you sh cherish in your family? Do you have a family ritual? Anybody want to share a ritual that you love about your family? Yes. Easter egg hunt. Okay. Uh -huh, okay. Ah, uh, wonder. It's ritual, it's a tradition. Yes. Wonderful, what a wonderful one. And just the way you're saying, the, the older ones are helping the younger ones, so it's a ritual that's being passed on. Yeah. Barbara, did you want to add one? It's wonderful, and it is wonderful that we keep, you know. I think about birthday cakes. I was, um, my sister-in-law, Willie, is an only child, and um, 
I think joining our family was a bit daunting for her in the beginning, but she has truly become our sister. And the, we were out to dinner a few weeks ago, and, and I was saying, do you remember how your parents used to take their wedding rings at every birthday uh, when the birthday cake was lit? They would put their ring around the candle. They would, they would put it on the cake so that everybody got to make a wish that way. And she, she looked at me and she said, I'd forgotten all about that. Thank you for remembering that. And I said, oh, that was such a lovely ritual. You know, and so um, there's stories that go with ritual. There's associations that go with ritual. We could define ritual as a patterned way of doing something that includes symbols, movement, and words, and is rooted in common history. We have different types of rituals. Daily rituals. How many of you get dressed the same way every morning? Okay. And if something doesn't go right, your whole day's thrown off. Jeez, you know, the coffee maker didn't work, or, you know, I get up in the morning and pad downstairs with my journal, and I have my quiet time. If Ron gets up before me, he messes it up, man. <laughs> so, daily rituals. And, um, those are very important. Then we have annual rituals like the Easter egg hunt, the, the Christmas uh, birthdays, that sort of thing. Seasonal rituals around our holidays and holy days. And then, of course, life transitions. And these kind of move in and out of one another. But the rituals, think of the rituals that are associated with funerals, weddings. Um, many cultures have um, uh, rituals that, that move people into, you know, uh, adolescent, bar mitzvah, you know, quinceañeras, those sort of rituals that are very important to help people trans transition into stages of life. Rituals matter because, first of all, they establish identity at different levels, especially when we couple them with storytelling. Uh, there's a strong link between ritual and storytelling. Usually there is a story, and that's another way uh, that families that you think, you know, in your parish you don't tell stories. That's one way to link them into their stories is through the rituals. Uh, and not necessarily always the ones that we think of, but think about those four different, you know, the daily rituals um, as well as the, as the big ones. They uh, maintain stability. Uh, think about what happens in a family when somebody gets ill. Somebody dies. There's, uh, you know, there's some kind of loss. What do we describe as going back to normal? You know, what does that mean? It's usually that we pick up our rituals again, isn't it? Um, so there is a stability that's uh, that's added there. Rituals, though, also help us um, stay flexible and change. So we have transitional rituals like weddings and funerals which essentially help us let go of somebody so that they can move on to another life. Um, in Ambrecht's book about Nepal, she says that when at the time of weddings, the mothers accompany their daughters and there's this terrible sobbing uh, that goes on as part of it because the mothers realize their daughters may leave the village and they may never see them again. So in that ritual, there's also death. You know, and you look at different cultures that have those kind of realities. But rituals help us let go of people. They mark endings and new beginnings. Sometimes we need to let, have a ritual for the ritual. Let's let this thing die, you know. Let's bury the fruitcake and the recipe and never make it again. <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Rituals establish continuity with the past and hope and expectancy of the future. Uh, you look at what we did as a nation uh, when, after the 9-11 attacks. You know, we sang uh, America the Beautiful. We, we pulled out our songs. I, remember, I just remember that uh, image of all the entire Congress standing behind the president. And they're all singing that song. You know, I think it was America the Beautiful. And there was such a sense then of we're going to be together. And there was, folded into that was, this is a song we know, you know, that's part of our past. But what it was was a strong sign to us, we're going to survive this. We're going to get through this. That's very important. 
You can learn a lot about a family through the rituals. Um, rituals convey a lot about rules, roles, and values. And usually those are sort of th uh, things that are conveyed at a nonverbal level. Um, my husband is fond of reminding me of how he's, geez, your family. You, you know, he loves my family, really, but he says, you say goodbye five you say goodbye in the living room, and then you go to the front hall, and then you go to the porch, and then you walk each other to the car. You know, when do you <laughs> just get in the car and say goodbye? And his family, he has two brothers, they don't do that. They say goodbye and leave. I was shocked. I didn't know people said goodbye like that. Um, what that says is when we married, how we had to kind of, um, you know, look at bonding some of our rituals and helping one another understand our families, um, what is communicated in, in those kind of rituals. Rituals are a wonderful way to promote healing. Funerals, for example. Uh, but there are also rec reconciliation rituals that we follow. They may not be formal, but we reconcile in some way, and I'll talk about that a little bit in, in terms of forgiveness. Um, I am from... Um, Colorado, I worked in a parish in Littleton, Colorado at the time of the Columbine shootings, uh, which was essentially the parish next door to us. It was like um, being at the epicenter of an earthquake that's still, by the way, reverberating through the community. The wounds are, are still there and they're oozing. But one of the most brilliant things our parish was able to do, uh, the, the Sunday after the shootings, uh, we invited people to come forward to receive um, the oil of the sick. And because we recognized that as a community we were wounded deeply. And um, we couldn't talk about closure. You know, Tom Brokaw was on the news talking about closure as kids were running out of the school. And it's like, this is going to take a long, long time. What I saw in that beauty of Catholic ritual you know, to help in a healing process. And I was sitting in the back of the church at one of the masses because everybody went forward. They were just sobbing and crying. And the little children, of course, didn't quite understand what was going on. And I watched two little girls making the sign of the cross on each other's forehead, mimicking what they saw going on. You know, so rituals are, you know, was such an important thing. And I talked to people at Pax Christi about that who still remember that as one of the most healing experiences of their lives at one of the most difficult times. Um, let's see, before I go into that. They, they also offer a potential for positive modeling. Robert Fulgham in his book, Every, um, Everything I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, he says, don't worry that your children don't listen to you. Worry that they're always watching you. Uh, if any of you are teachers, how many of you are teachers or catechists? Have you ever watched kids play teacher and play school? It's not a pretty sight sometimes. <laughs> um, the church, of course, is steeped in ritual and tradition. The first understanding of what this is and how it works begins in the home, whether parents are aware of it or not. Ritual has the power to convey what words cannot. Just think of that Emmaus story. They don't recognize Jesus when he's walking with them. They don't recognize him when he's talking to them, telling them stories. When do they finally see who he is? The breaking of the bread. Nonverbal, but a ritual that they're steeped in. Some of us come from very highly ritualized families. <laughs> Others do not. My husband Ron being one of them, who doesn't understand why we have to say goodbye five times in five different places. And yet, most of us have some rudimentary understanding of sacramental ritual because of our families. There's a great potential then to make connections between home rituals and symbols and the rituals and symbols of the church, particularly the sacraments. Daily rituals such as saying prayers together or by ourselves result in powerful messages and lessons. I grew up seeing my parents each kneel by their bed at night with prayer books. You know, it was such a powerful symbol to me of what, what prayer meant. They never told us not to bother them, but we knew. We knew it was their time. Um, I don't pray in the same way they do, but when my mom died, 
I found her prayer book and I had to have it. You know, it was so beautiful to see that. And so we have to encourage parents in what they do. Uh, as Paul Jim says, children are watching. Children are watching. Um, what are we letting them see, you know, about our daily rituals? We can make this uh, a spiritual practice and an intentional practice in, this, in, in the following ways. First of all, by emphasizing the importance of ritual uh, through the celebration of holiday seasons and special events. I'm not one to, to jump on a bandwagon, you know, like an Advent. So many parishes have, have things where they invite people to come and make Advent wreaths, you know. And I think, why not have families bring the Advent wreath they have uh, from their home and tell a story about it and bless it? And then the, those who don't have one could make one, but to keep it and to pass it on. Baptismal garments are a wonderful example. I was at a baptism one time where the priest told a story. He was baptizing his niece at our, uh, his niece's parish. And he talked about the baptismal garment as being one he wore, his sister wore, the child's mother wore, and the baby wore. There wasn't a dry eye in that church because we all in some way related to that, the passing on. Um, so we need to emphasize that importance Linking um, the home celebrations with that of the church. Look at all the things that we do in our homes that are um, reflected in sacraments. You know, we extend forgiveness. We share. We break bread together. We welcome new members into our family. You know, uh, and look at all the rich symbols of baptism, Eucharist, reconciliation. Um, all of those have tremendous opportunities to be linked with family. Um, celebrating our ethnic heritage um, it is such a gift for, for families that, that celebrate, you know, where they came from. Uh, and some ethnic groups have much stronger bonds in that way, which is so important. Um, that, that whole roots idea, you know, I, I went to Ireland with my son a few years ago. I was so aware of my great-grandmother, you know, growing up there and coming, you know, um, coming from uh, Ireland into the U.S. Um, and then the looking at blending of rituals uh, that happens whenever two people marry. You know, we have to blend our traditions. We have to adapt our rituals. You know what the, the uh, reason for the first, uh, most frequent first argument in a marriage is? Christmas. How do we celebrate Christmas? Do we do it your way or do we do it the right way? <laughs> you know? I mean, and that, and that can lead to a lot of big disagreements. Do we go to your family or my family? You know, how do we blend the rituals so that accommodating one another. Certainly I've had to do that uh, out of respect for Ron. You know, he's from a smaller family, you know. And so some of our family stuff gets so involved, you know. When do I, you know, back off? And when, how do we, you know, acknowledge the Hendrix side and looking at what, they're, what they find important? And that's, that's a very important thing to kind of negotiate. Um, Finding and, and using ways to incorporate rituals into the changes in family life. Everything from grieving the loss of a pet to moving to a new town, to welcoming a new member to the family, to acknowledging the pain that results from divorce. Um, all those reasons that rituals matter are, are, are part of that. Children are going to go through periods in which they reject family rituals. Um, that's my advice. Ignore them. <laughs> they don't know what's good for them. Especially during adolescence, because uh, in a sense they don't understand it. They roll their eyes. That's just a genetic trait that comes, you know. It just for some reason, girls especially, oh, mom, you know. And yet they come back. How many of you have had kids come back from college and they want to know why? Why don't you have this? You know, we've got to make this food and everything has to be the same. You know, <laughs> um, I think it's important that we, we just continue on. Um, because in time, like, um, 
like Ruth Lewinsky talks about, in mid-time, in the mid-part of our lives, we start to look at these things in different ways, and so will they. There are other times, though, when we must recognize the need to change, adapt, or drop rituals that no longer hold meaning for us. Those that are the most valuable tend to stay because we know their intrinsic grace, even if we don't talk about it. Have any of you been to Oklahoma City um, to see the memorial there? Uh, this is a statue that the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City erected across the street from the memorial um, gardens. It's Jesus weeping, and his back is turned to uh, the site of the bombing. It's very touching. The archdiocese uh, had a house on that corner, and it was destroyed during the bombing. There were 16 buildings damaged or destroyed. I didn't realize that. We um, stopped in Oklahoma City um, on, as part of this year-long travel thing that Ron and I did last year. We were on the road for a year. We went to all 48 contiguous U.S. states. We drove over 40,000 miles. He took over 20,000 photographs. So. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, all of the, the ones that I've used for this presentation are his photos. And what was striking, we ended up going to a lot of cemeteries uh, for some reason. And, you know, places like Gettysburg, Vicksburg, um, the Oklahoma City Memorial, these places that were at one time sites of incredible violence and destruction have been transformed primarily into gardens. It's very striking. Um, and you've probably seen pictures of the Oklahoma City Memorial where they put chairs representing all of the people that were killed as a result of the bombing. And then they have something like 16 or 17 small chairs for the children. And there are teddy bears sitting on those chairs. It's just so touching. Um, and it speaks to me strongly of the image of forgiveness and the importance of that. When you think about a garden, think about the potential of damage that uh, is inflicted in a garden when a noxious weed overtakes it and chokes it if it's not rooted out. In essence, that's what conflict and unresolved hurt does in family life. And um, anybody who works in law enforcement will tell you that the worst possible scenario to, to walk into and most dangerous for a law enforcement officer is domestic dispute. Uh, my niece um, Tracy's husband Chris was a member of the Los Angeles Police Department and he was badly beaten in a uh, domestic violence dispute when, when someone turned on him. And um, you think about, you know, it just seems so crazy that we can do so much damage in our family. But the reason is we know how to hurt each other, you know? Because we know each other's stories, we can turn the story on one another. We know the rituals. Uh, we know the, the behaviors, everything that we can really, if we want, really sock it to them, you know? And so you look at, um, the kind of the typical arguments that go on in families and one of the ways to sustain the conflict is let's bring up past history, you know. Like Irma Bombeck says, why is it that every argument we ever had ends up with why did your mother wear black to our wedding? You know? <laughs> um, and you think about the different types of family hurts, festering wounds, um, suffocating silence generational grudges and the inability to blossom. You know, we're just always kind of kept down. When you think back to those ghost stories, some of them are benign stories, you know, the ghost stories of don't do that because you know what happened to Uncle Henry when he, you know, blah, blah. but others are very deep and haunting. Stories of family dynamics that shame or blame and damage is done over time. Uh, when I worked in the spiritual direction program as a facilitator in Denver, um, what was striking to me was the number of people who had stories of abuse, sexual or, or, or emotional abuse that came within their family, and how many years and years and years of work it takes to go through that and, and, um, and work through that, the shame that comes with that, the blame, the anger, the, the damage. 
Jesus places so much emphasis on forgiveness in the Gospels. Um, he uses a story of a family to describe reconciliation, and it's so, um, that's the story that I referred to earlier, that is a universal story. Do you know which story I'm referring to? The prodigal son. There's no right really to understand how the sacramental process uh, works in the sacrament of, of penance and reconciliation if we don't read the prodigal son story because it's grounded in that. Um, and what family in some way doesn't relate to that? A child that's run away, and maybe it was me, or I'm the child that stayed at home. The good child, the good son, the good daughter, and I have that resentment that why wasn't I recognized? You know, it's such a powerful, powerful story. Um, and it keeps getting retold in um, contemporary uh, ways because it stays relevant. It's about family dynamics. Broken relationships in that story are healed at all sorts of levels. The relationships uh, with ourselves, relationship with others, uh, with the larger community, and with God. So um, I'd like you to revisit, and this isn't something you're going to share with anybody, but just for a moment, um, reflect on any unresolved hurt that you could identify in your own family. And again, this isn't to share with anybody, but just let it rise a little bit in you. And you may want to take that story uh, with you as we walk through this process of and, and spiritual practice. Uh, there are different ways to look at how forgiveness um, happens, and, and I think one of maybe one of the um, downsides, if you will, if, if you want to call it that, in the way the church has celebrated the sacrament of reconciliation is that we have given maybe the impression that forgiveness happens like this, and then it's all over, or that reconciliation and forgiveness are the same things, and they're not. You know, forgiveness uh, for deep, deep hurts and deep wounds takes a long time. So it is a process. And so using that whole um, story of the prodigal son to kind of walk us through that, let's look at four uh, aspects of this. The first is to express or name the need for forgiveness. Think about the prodigal son. He runs off, he has this, you know, wonderful time blowing the wad, you know, <laughs> spending his money. And then where does he end up? The pigsty. Now think of Jewish listeners. He's in a pigsty, the dirtiest, filthiest place that, the, that a Jewish listener could, th could think of to be. He has hit absolutely rock bottom. Sometimes we have to hit rock bottom before we understand the need for forgiveness. The addict understands that, that hits the rock bottom. You know, and you look at the 12-step program. One of the first is that, that acknowledgement of our need for healing, for wholeness. When we grow in relationships, we attain a power to hurt others. Think about the ways parents, spouses, children, siblings can hurt one another and how we can hurt them. And some of them can just be, you know, very, uh, like I said, kind of benign things that we get over. Uh, others are rooted very deeply. A starting point then for forgiveness is recognizing this power in ourselves. If I understand that I can really wound somebody, you know, then we understand and other people can do that to me then I understand that there is a need for forgiveness. And that may seem like a no-brainer, but I think there are people that don't understand that. They, first of all, they don't understand how damaging their words are, their actions are, their behaviors are, and they also don't understand or don't want to accept how deeply wounded they have been. You know? And so it's, it's a two-part process. Of, of really understanding and recognizing that. The first step in seeking forgiveness or extending it is honestly facing the way we have hurt someone or been hurt. The development of a conscience is an important part of human development. Think of people that are out there that are basically amoral. It's a frightening thought. You know? um, the fact that we can feel guilty, that we can feel ashamed, we can feel bad, 
is not a horrible thing. It's a sign of, of something human in us. That as long as we don't let it become toxic or neurotic. You know? um, I, I talked to a woman once who said, oh, I feel guilty about everything. You know, everything that happens, starving children in Africa, I feel guilty over that. <laughs> you know, and I said, well, there's a difference between healthy guilt and neurotic guilt, you know, of things that you really don't have any uh, power over. But it, and it doesn't mean obsessing over our faults or feeling the need to point those out to others. And sometimes parents are very eager to do that. You know, you know what you need? You know, <laughs> um, that what we need to do with children is guide them in that understanding. How many of us have been um, under that umbrella? We've had somebody shame us when we were children. And that is a shadow that stays on us for forever ever and ever and ever, and it can take so long to come out of that. So I'm not advocating that at all. Um, playing the victim, blaming others, bringing up past hurts, pulling power plays, inflicting guilt or shame on others. Um, those are the sort of things, though, that come up in family arguments a lot of times. Um, another way that we start to develop an awareness is to start looking at what underlies the anger. Uh, several years ago, when I worked in the Diocese of Colorado Springs, uh, I was the director of religious education there, the bishop appointed me as part of a pastoral team to pastor a parish that had gone through tremendous upheaval. One of their pastors had committed suicide, another one had, you know, was an alcoholic and ended up leaving. It was just, you know, and it was like a family system. Any of you that work in parish and know that a parish has had a lot of, of hurt is like a family system. That systemic hurt goes down deep and it affects people. So he figured, he was not putting another priest in there as pastor till something got surfaced there in terms of the staff because they were very, very angry. So I went to, we, I remember going to one meeting with the rest of the team and we're sitting there listening to one person after the other vent. You know, they're angry at somebody. They're angry at the bishop. They were angry at the people. They were angry at each other. <laughs> And we weren't getting anywhere. And I was just sitting there thinking, what, you know, how long can this go on? And finally, uh, the, one of the priests that was on the team, Father Tom, very gentle, um, very wise man, listened for a while. And then he said, okay, here's the deal. He said, you know, under anger, what underlies anger is either hurt or fear. Now, he said, I'd like to go around the room and ask you to name what are, what's hurting you or what are you afraid of? Instantly, instantly, the room dynamics changed. And we started to get somewhere. Because when we heard, I'm hurt that the bishop didn't consult with us. I'm angry that father committed suicide and didn't let us help him. You know? And then you start seeing this is something you can work with instead of somebody throwing their anger at you at all times. I am... Um, I really found this an incredibly important revelation uh, at that time in my life because both of my children uh, were in middle school and they were um, at a point where they could not sit on the couch together and watch TV without complaining that this one was touching me, she's looking at me. She's, you know, we had just nonstop arguments in our house, and so I would try to listen to the hurt and the fear <laughs> under their argument. It didn't always work, but it, le it led to a new kind of understanding of how we can get to that awareness. And also looking at myself, when I react, what is underneath that? Stop and step back. You know, you think that's part of a contemplative life. Step back, not in judgment, but just say, what's, what's that about? Why did I react so much? Everything from driving in the car and somebody cuts you off and you are just mad as hell. It's like, what is that about? Where is that coming from? You know? Maybe it's because I'm afraid he almost ran into me. That could have killed me. You know? I mean, when you start to recognize that. This is a conversion process in which we own our power. The prodigal son story, the youngest son comes to a sense of what he did which then enables him to move to the next step, which is confession. Confession is phony, however, if it isn't preceded by conversion, which is an acceptance of responsibility for my own actions. That's why it almost never works for parents to say, now tell them you're sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> never works because there's no conversion there. 
The second part of that process is initiating that extension of forgiveness. Uh, when uh, my son Eric was uh, probably about eight or nine years old, he, he's very strong-willed and so am I, and we had um, a very uh, spirited discussion one night. <laughs> Uh, and he was not going to see things my way. We got into a big argument. And uh, it was very unusual. We went to bed mad. Both of us were really mad. Now, the kicker to this story was I had to get up the next morning and go to the Diocese of Pueblo and give a talk on the Sacrament of Reconciliation. <laughs> it was God saying, ha, you think you're so smart? You know, work this out. So I'm lying in bed that morning thinking about my dilemma. How do I go and give this talk without the big hypocrisy, you know, <laughs> sort of uh, attitude flying around me, you know, when I couldn't speak to my own son. And in comes Eric. And I'm not making this up. He knelt by the side of the bed. And he said, Mom, I'm sorry. And I thought, oh, this wave of relief. Coming to his senses at last. My son has come to his senses at last. I'm thinking, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And then I heard the word, but... It wasn't all my fault. Okay, there he held me to accountability. There I was having to say, yes, I had part in this. I didn't listen to him. I didn't honor him. I didn't respect him. You know? And so it opened up a doorway for the extension uh, of forgiveness. But he was the initiator. The child was the initiator. Talk about humbling. When we're stubborn about being the first to initiate forgiveness, which is sometimes things uh, parents struggle with, teachers struggle with, I think anybody in authority struggles with, look at our political leaders that have such a hard time saying, I blew it, you know, um, I was wrong. You know, it can slow down or even stop the process of forgiveness altogether. It's not easy, but asking for forgiveness provides a sense of relief. There was such a relief when Eric said that, you know, even the but part, you know, because it, it enabled me to say and own my own part in the, in the whole thing. And then we could get somewhere. You can't get anywhere if we're each going to stay stubbornly, you know, um, wedded to our own views, our own version of a story. When two people in a household are in conflict, everyone suffers, don't they? It's that family system thing. Have you ever had a meal where every, somebody's mad at one another, somebody else? You know, what do we say about the tension? You could cut it with a knife. You know, it's horrible. Um, it's a systemic thing. As Diane Setterfield says in her book, The 13th Tale, families are webs. Impossible to touch one part of it without setting the rest vibrating. Impossible to understand our part with have, without having a sense of the whole. Um, so the stories even that we learn, you know, getting back to storytelling, and all these practices are really woven into one another, even though I'm taking them separately. But storytelling is so much part of that. There is such a way that we can start to understand our dynamics through the way our families grew up. I lived with a, a roommate when I was in college whose father would not allow any of them to express anger. He said, she told me, she said, if, if any of us were mad or there was a fight, dad made us stay in the room. And we couldn't express how angry we were. Needless to say, Joanne was in counseling <laughs> for a long time. What she found with that was how difficult it was for her to deal with any kind of conflict because she didn't know how to express her anger in healthy ways. She had it shut down. So when we start to tell those stories, it's not to say dad was bad. Dad, you know, who knows where he learned his story, you know, and, and how that got passed on. The, the break comes is when we break the chain. And that's what a, a young a mother said to me once uh, about the conflict she has with her mother. You know, um, I went to lunch with them one day and it was appalling to see the way her mom talked to her, you know dismissed her, interrupted her, you know, and, and Joni said to me, I'm not, I'm going to break the chain with my daughters. I'm not going to do that to them. And it wasn't to say that she, she hated her mother or anything. She had made peace with that, but she began to see, I'm not going to continue that. Okay. And that, that is a part of that as well, is owning also what happens to us.
It takes someone to start the process. The best way, again, for parents to teach this is through modeling. I wish I could say I was the one that had crept into Eric's room and said, Eric, I'm sorry, but, <laughs> you know, um, you know, but that, that is a wonderful way to see it. The, the prodigal son's confession, listen to this, I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The son comes to the point of recognizing his need for forgiveness, and then he develops a confession that names it. Wayne Muller, in his book, Learning to Pray, which is absolutely my favorite book on prayer, uh, it takes the Our Father word by word, passage by passage, and goes through it. And he says the only act of a, the act that is asked of us in the Our Father is that of extending forgiveness. As we forgive those who trespass against us. All the other passages or pieces of the Our Father are petitions. Give us this day our daily bread, you know. Uh, but we are asked to extend forgiveness. Confession has long been a part of the Catholic Church's tradition, one that is expressed in several of our sacraments, in penance, bless me, for I have sinned, in Eucharist, I confess to Almighty God, in the anointing of the sick, where we confess our need for healing, for forgiveness, for wholeness. How can this become then a practice in our families? Sometimes a third person is helpful in acting as an agent for, of forgiveness, particularly in situations where there's deep, deep conflict and unresolved hurt. Now, that doesn't mean I start to interfere or gloss over the, pro the problem. Um, instead, a person, this third person can help by encouraging discussion or dialogue or letting people vent. Uh, Father Tom was that, that agent of reconciliation with that staff when he invited them to go a little further, explore their anger a little further. And so that role of confessor, we see, which has long been part of the church's rite of penance. It makes sense that we talk to somebody who's non-involved, who can stay outside of that. Otherwise, it becomes that Tom and Jerry cartoon, you know, where the cat and the mouse, they're, they're fighting with one another and they roll over, and everything gets caught up in the vortex of their conflict. You know, that's what can happen with parents. Um, you know, stop yelling at each other, you know, that sort of thing. And you, before you know it, you're kind of part of that. Well, who do families seek out as third person? Sometimes it, it could be other family members, a spouse, a sibling, a grandparent, as long as they don't triangle, you know. Because when we triangle, that means then I get part of the conflict, and then I start throwing in my two cents. They really have to be somebody who is objective, who can stay out of the conflict themselves. It can be tricky to have that, that be a family member, though. It almost never works when the conflict is too deep-rooted. For severe family conflicts, the use of a counselor through a school or a professional church can help families name the conflict, stay on the subject, deal with the problem, confess their failings, their needs, their wants, and suggest ways to come together. And that's very important for us, I think, those of you who are in parish ministry to understand that and have, you know, accessible for people lists of spiritual directors, counselors, you know, people that can help people walk through some of those conflicts. Then the third part of this process is implementing the language of forgiveness. Um, at Ivy Lane, we actually had Ivy growing on our house. It was a nice little thought <laughs> to have the street named Ivy. And uh, our house was a Tudor style uh, architecture. And this ivy, these ivy vines grew up the sides of the house. I just love them because they turn bright, bright red in the fall. And every year, my dad in the spring would pull the vines down. And I hated it because I was always afraid they wouldn't grow back. Um, and over time, I began to understand that what dad was doing was actually healthy for the vines. It not only cultivated growth, but it kept us from getting entombed in our house. If he hadn't, you know, pulled them apart, we literally would have been sealed into our home. <laughs> Um, kind of like uh, Briar Rose, you know, in Sleeping Beauty when the briars <laughs> grow around. And think about how homes and families that do get so entwined in their hurts, they're entombed in their own pain. Um, 
To make forgiveness a practice, we have to use the language of forgiveness. Um, exposing children to words, especially um, from parents, but from all adults that include, I'm sorry, forgive me, I love you, you know. Think of the, the wonderful language of forgiveness in the prodigal son. Everything I have is yours, you know. You know, which is what the father says, confesses to the second son, not the first one. I love you, and I, I want you to come back in the house. You know, but we had to celebrate because your brother was lost and is found. He was dead and he's alive. And there's this language um, of welcome, of invitation, of openness. Uh, body language is also part of the process. You know, what kind of body language do we give out when we're... Um, when we're in conflict. You want to show me some? Yeah, the folded arms, the tapping foot, the rolling eyes, the, you, know, um, you know, the silent treatment, which I used to try in my husband, um, but when you give the silent treatment to an introvert, they think it's actually a gift. So that's <laughs> not a good thing. <laughs> it's like, oh, you, you didn't talk to me for four hours? I didn't notice. <laughs> Um, the language of forgiveness, though, goes from this to this, doesn't it? It's an openness. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's an invitation. Think about that language being ongoing, not just when rifts take place, and how powerful it was for us as an entire country when we watched the Mennonites. Was it in Pennsylvania where the shooting happened? And they forgave that shooter. And we all understood that that wasn't just tokenism on their part. How did it happen? Because it was rooted in their whole being, in their family, in their religious beliefs. They spoke, they lived, they breathed the language of forgiveness, which allowed them to do which most of us would find almost impossible, to forgive someone who slaughtered their children. Their children, you know. It's, it's important that we make it then part of our culture uh, and we practice it every day. Another important aspect of this language involves silence. That means I'm willing to listen to your story without interrupting, without putting my own spin on it, without telling you and correcting your interpretation, just listening. And that may be the hardest part of of the forgiveness process is giving people time and space versus jumping to our own conclusion. In Anne Ambrecht's book, uh, Thin Places, she talks about her experience of going to Nepal and looking for home in this far off country when she's in this very difficult situation with her husband, uh, where they're getting more and more um, estranged from one another. And she describes one scene in which the two of them tried to talk and she realized what was happening. She said, each of us was so focused on telling our own story that neither of us could pause to really comprehend what the other was asking. Instead of revelations, our stories became versions of the world that we had to defend, like a plot of land, our last line of defense against the unknown. Very powerful. Am I letting someone tell their story, and am I listening to it, or am I insisting on, on making the story about me? Um, I learned a lot about this from a, a, a woman um, I'll call Marion, who came to see me once when I was uh, working as a parish life coordinator at a parish. We, I was at Pax Christi Parish in Littleton. We had no uh, resident priest as pastor, so I was named in that role. And, and so I you know, had... Um, so many different things going on, and then one day Marion called me and said, I just need to come and talk to somebody. Would you, you know, do you mind if I come and see you? So I said, no, that's fine. She comes in, she just pours out this story about how difficult she um, is finding it to be around her ex-husband. Um, you know, they've been divorced for several years, um, but they had joint custody of their children, and so he was still part of the scene. And she said, she confesses, he still knows how to push my button. And she says, I need, and this was the thing I learned. She says, I need to let go of this. I need to let go of the power he has to keep hurting me. Now that was profound. 
Because what I saw in that was not forgiveness as, you know, that wimpy sort of, it's all right, it doesn't matter. Of course it matters. Jesus was not asking us to become doormats for other people's neuroses. And when I once heard a wonderful interpretation of the story of Turn the Other Cheek, um, which was that uh, when, uh, you know, a, a, a master slapped a slave, he would backhand the slave because it was another way to show the master's superiority. You would slap somebody on uh, the cheek with your, you know, the force of your open palm if they were a peer. And Jesus in saying, turn the other cheek, says, then they can't backhand you again. They have to slap you as a peer. Isn't that interesting? Uh, so he's, I don't, this is an advocacy for let's go slap each other around. <laughs> but I think when I heard that, I thought, what a whole different interpretation of this, of turning the other cheek, but also standing our ground. I am a person. I am a person. One of my favorite encounters descri is described in a, a book, The Color Purple. Love that book. And if you're familiar with the, the story of Celie, who's just totally, you know, abused by her, her husband, who's so cruel to her. And through the, her friendship with a woman named Suge, she starts to see herself as valuable and beautiful in herself. And her husband says to her one day, when she defies him finally and says, I'm leaving, he says, where are you going to go? You're poor, you're black, you're ugly. And she says, I may be poor, and I may be black, and I may be ugly, but I am here. And it is her way of saying, if you're going to slap me, you're not going to backhand me. I'm standing my ground. I am who I am. She becomes such a wonderful figure of Christ in this story, of, of a person who's standing with integrity. Uh, and that's what I think Jesus calls us to. Forgiveness takes time and it takes energy, and it takes openness. Um, and when we let go, uh, when we say, I, I cannot keep letting these people hurt me over and over again, was, was the response of one of the fathers of a victim at the Oklahoma City bombing, who refused to go watch Timothy McVeigh being executed, because he says, I have to forgive him. If I don't, he'll keep shooting, or you know, blowing up my daughter over and over and over again, and I'm not giving him that kind of power. See, that's empowerment of the best sort. And we have to see forgiveness in this way. It takes time. We cannot push anyone, our children, our spouses, our parents, and especially ourselves, to be forgive before we are ready. Otherwise, it becomes insincere. It becomes superficial. And all of these steps take time. Anybody in a 12-step program knows that. They're not going to whip through it, you know. This month, I'm on this step. This month, I mean, it'll take some people years to get beyond step two, you know. Um, the older we get, too, the harder it is to forgive. Ironically, this may be due to the memory of deeply held stories or family rituals that are damaging and hurtful. Sometimes reconciling with others is impossible. I once spoke to a group, um, an elder hostel group, about forgiveness in the family. That was daunting. I thought, what am I going to tell people in their 80s about forgiving their family? But afterwards, uh, one of the sisters, it was at a Benedictine monastery, and there was a, one of the, the Benedictine nuns was there, and she came up to me, and she said, how do I forgive someone who's dead? And she told me how her father had been so abusive towards her mother, and she said, I can't, I can't forgive him, and he's been dead, and how can I let go of that? And we talked about, you know, you know, my little catechetical training comes out, well, write him a letter and burn it, you know. <laughs> but I mean, what, you know, what, that's, that question hung with me and haunted me for a long time. This was a, a woman who's given her life, you know, to religious vocation, and yet that was weighing on her heart. There's no easy answer to that. Uh, sometimes it is impossible but to reconcile with someone else, but reconciling with ourselves is such a necessary part of that healing. And only then can we understand then what the church says, we celebrate the sacrament of forgiveness. Now I grew up, you know, being so afraid of the confessional, 
you know, of all the rubrics that I would forget, the, you know, how to say, you know, the whole formula, bless me, Father, for I have sinned, you know, I don't know whether I've sinned, I'm eight years old, I don't know. You know, I'd always confess that I fought with my brother, because I figure even if I couldn't remember specifically fighting with Larry, I figure I probably did it sometime <laughs> during the past week. And so the only celebration I had was that the relief that it was all over with <laughs> for a week. And there are a lot of adults that have those old memories of, of the confessional that aren't necessarily positive. But one, uh, when the church did this sacramental you know, review and, and revision of our sacraments after Vatican II, there was such an emphasis on the grace of forgiveness and the celebration, which is part of the prodigal son's story. He throws a party for the lost son. And when you think about that in terms of parenting, who of us wouldn't, after their child's been gone, and think of how long he was gone, gone long enough for a famine to have broken out in the land. Famines took years and years and maybe decades, and it said the father was on the road, I picture him, wringing his hands, waiting, waiting, waiting. Of course you'd have a, a party. You'd have a good talking with him <laughs> afterwards. But I think there's that whole idea of celebration. There was such light that was let into our house when my father tore down the ivy vines. Uh, I remember that being so striking in my bedroom that, that it, I hadn't realized how darkened the, light, the vines made the bedroom until they were pulled down. And that's the way it is in the forgiveness um, process. We're able to see out as well as to allow the light to pour in. There's great relief that comes with forgiveness and the light it lets into our heart and souls when the toxins of shame and guilt, resentment, anger, and violence are released. The benefits of forgiveness are numerous. Our hearts and minds feel lighter and we may have a new way to look into the hearts and actions of others, especially those with whom we have been in conflict. We experience renewed hope and faith in those around us. I think in the home, this happens in different ways. Uh, first, through touch. You know, it's such a human thing that we would reach out and touch one another. You know, hugging one another. And when Eric crawled, you know, he, after he was kneeling on the floor and, <laughs> and we got to the point of he confessed to me and I confessed to him and we both said we were sorry, he craw crawled up into the bed and we snuggled under the covers and laughed. And that was such a part of it. it was, he really sent me on my way that day with a light heart. Um, one of the most simplest and most profound ways of celebrating reconciliation is physical touch. But it also is a process of allowing ourselves to be touched by another's extension or seeking of forgiveness. And it may be harder, actually, for us to receive forgiveness than to give it out. Do you ever find it that way? I'm so bad. So I'm always making these mistakes. When we let somebody else just touch us, you know, whether that's in a physical sense or an emotional, we're saying, okay, I'm not perfect, but I am like Shug or Seely. I am here. I'm beloved of God. You know, I'm doing the best I can. You know, those are sorts of ways that we say we allow ourselves to be touched. Embracing ourselves for who we are. As Anne Ambrock says, we see the weed as well as the flower in ourselves. And that's just the way it is. It also is a restoration of the routine, as I spoke earlier. In the story of the prodigal son, the father throws a party for the younger son. It not only celebrates his return, but in a sense it allows the household to return to normal. You know, there is a transition piece there that the father has this in an instinctive understanding of. Oftentimes, the greatest relief is being able to go about business as usual without tiptoeing around one another, measuring every word, you know, what am I saying, what am I doing? That great, <sighs> that is felt, if not directly stated. Um, you know, and this is something to be aware of, especially with regard to those who might be vulnerable uh, in our families. Uh, there are children sometimes who absorb pain. You know, I was always aware of that as a teacher, the sensitive little child in the class that took on everybody's, you know, if I'd get upset with the class and she'd be the one that would come up to me at recess, I'm so sorry about the way the class, you know, she'd write me little love notes or whatever to make, you know, those are the kind, and there are other kids like, Bip, you know, rolls right off. <laughs> 
Um, you know, who are those members of our family that, um, in a sense, are more vulnerable and more sensitive? Um, we may need special sensitivity to, to reach out to them. Um, think about the older son in the prodigal so son story. It's a very interesting touch that in Luke's gospel, we don't ever find out whether that son is reconciled. And yet the father does the same thing for him, comes out of the house, confesses his love and his fidelity to him, invites him in. It's up to that son to say, I'll go or not. But the father had that sensitivity to come out instead of saying, well, he'll get over it, you know. Um, maybe he won't. I mean, that, younger, that older son had some very good points. Uh, that some of us could really relate to. I've been the one, you know, I was the good child. Where's my reward? Where's my party? Where's my fatted calf, you know? Um, so that takes, that takes sensitivity. Uh, the process of forgiveness also is one that invites us to reflection. There is a, there's an alarming lack of reflection in our society, in our culture, due to the hectic pace of our lives that robs us of precious time to think about what happened. Uh, what conversions, what confessions took place? How did I grow through the experience? What I learned, how God was present to me throughout it. This is a rich soil for contemplative prayer, you know, to sit with it, to say, you know, not so much, you know, and that I think is where our resolution comes in after a confession. And it's not just that I'm not going to do this again because, you know, I probably will, but, <laughs> but that I learn from it that it's, I'm not caught in a vicious cycle, but in a spiral that is spiraling me, even if I do the same sort of dumb thing again, open my mouth again and blurt something out, you know, I shouldn't have done, that I'm learning in some ways to listen more attentively, you know, to be more present to be less judgmental, to be kinder, you know, all of that. Um, it's a wonderful time to journal and to invite children to think about that and talk about it. Anne Lamott says in her book, Grace Eventually, uh, and if you haven't read Anne Lamott, what a treat she is to read. Um, somebody called her the grumpy church lady, but she, <laughs> she writes, St. Paul, who can be such a grumpy book thumper, said that where sin abounds, grace abounds. And I think this is Paul at his most insightful, hopeful, faithful. If by sin we mean strictly the original archery term of missing the mark, sin and grace are not opposites, but partners like genes in DNA or the stages of childbirth. Uh, and it is a really lovely way to think of that. And then the last part of this is thanksgiving. Um, we're often very thankful, you know, first of all, that the tension's over with. We can eat dinner again without, you know, the strained silence. Um, that experience of coming together again for the way in which often in retrospect we see God's presence through the process of breaking up and making up, as the old song goes. In the parable of the prodigal son, the thanksgiving is symbolized by the party in which the lost one's return is celebrated. There's a connection in family processes of reconciliation with the larger world as well. You know, when we talk about social sin, that woman who said she's guilty about hunger in Africa was really, I think, probably a very well-formed Christian in the sense that she understood that there is such a reality of social sin. That when we argue in our families, you know, and I used to say that to our kids, if you can't get along with one another over who has the television remote, how can we expect peace in the Middle East? They didn't quite get the analogy when they were 13. <laughs> But there is something to that. Um, in his prayers, uh, book, Prayers for the Domestic Church, Father Edward Hayes writes, every sin has its effect upon the home, which then ripples out to the far shores of the earth. In like fashion, every act of pardon and reunion restores peace and health, not only to the home, but in a very real way to the whole world as well. Um, my husband, Ron, and my daughter, Anna, went on a trek in Nepal a few years ago, and they came back with prayer flags, which they said are just hanging everywhere in Nepal, in the most out-of-the-way you know, out places they'd see these prayer flags. And I went online to you know, kind of learn a little bit about them, because Ron hung them on our porch. And there's a belief that when the colors fade, um, that the prayers go out from the flags into the universe. 
I love that idea. It's that whole ripple idea. And we think about when we, when we share forgiveness, when we share peace, think of that rippling outward. Um, in her book, Real Kids, Real Faith, Karen Marie Eust writes, notes that helping children name their wrongdoing and helping them craft different, more loving responses is a way to help them expand their options. It's like tearing down the vines and letting the light shine in. She writes, we are often intrigued by people who have overcome great adversity to succeed in life. Our family prayers of confession and forgiveness help us recognize the spiritual power that infuses such changes, even when they are on a much more modest scale. You know, and I see a lot of parents, younger parents today, that are almost afraid to hold their children accountable. We want them to be friends or something. We don't want to upset them. Teachers are also caught in that bind. You know, my parents had no problem with that whatsoever. You know, where we see, you know, and part of it is that reaction, well, I don't want to be seen as negative. And we've done so much to help build kids' self-esteem and making them feel good about themselves, that we may be robbing them of this opportunity for self-reflection. And that's what it is. It's, it's an honest self-evaluation. I have the power to hurt one another, somebody else, but I also have the power to ask for forgiveness and extend forgiveness. When I myself feel overwhelmed by the violence and conflict that seems to envelop our world at times, I'm really heartened by this broader understanding of, of sin and grace uh, because then it begins, to, I begin to see that our little tiffs in family matter. And what we do, even if it's a very small reconciliation, ripples out into the universe like those prayers from the prayer flags, and it adds to balance. And that, I think, is what Jesus was preaching. Forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. You know? uh, be gracious, be open, uh, and be thankful. Wasn't that a lovely segue to the next practice? <laughs> um, a few uh, years ago, I called my daughter, Anna, who's now in uh, about 28, and um, I said to her, Anna, I want you to mark this day. It's the day I officially became an old fogey. <laughs> I had been in getting my hair cut, and um, a number of little girls, they were probably about six years old, came in with uh, their moms to get their hair done, their nails done, for a Cheetah Girls concert. Now, I didn't know who the Cheetah Girls were, so this was a mass massive cultural uh, education for me. And uh, as I heard this um, story being spun out about who the Cheetah Girls were and what was going on, and I'm thinking, $40 a piece for tickets to see them. Moms are bringing them in for haircuts, you know, color in their hair, nail polish. I'm thinking, what's going to happen with these kids for prom, you know? <laughs> Suddenly, my mother became, uh, you know, my mom believed in delayed gratification. Um, she used to say to us, you know, well, wait for your birthday or wait for Christmas. And when you're, you know, you're six, Christmas is a long way away in July. I began to understand mom's wisdom. She used to say to us, what will you have to look forward to? And I hated it when she said that. <laughs> But I have to say that day watching those kids, I thought, you know, not to say maybe they had a, just a fabulous time, maybe a once in a lifetime experience, but I'm afraid in a society where we give our kids so much so early that not only are they not gonna have anything to look forward to, they're not gonna have any reason to be grateful for anything because everything comes so easily. My mother also had a way of drawing attention to what we had versus what we lacked. Um, it affected me, and not always positively, I will say. You know, there were times when, yeah, yeah, I heard that one before. But, you know, that advice, ignore your kids. That's what she did with us. Because in the long run, she gave me an appreciation for the gift of appreciation. And it is a gift. What do you think makes it hard uh, for families, children, uh, adults, to be grateful what makes it hard to be grateful in this country, or right now, in, our, in this time? Yes? Okay. The reflection, we're busy, we don't have time to reflect and think, That's, that is very true, yes. 
Yes. It's very easy to be envious of others, and we know right away what others have. You can go on their Facebook page and learn all sorts of things. Yeah. Scarcity and fear, yes, which is very true right now, yes. Entitlement, yes, yes. We do feel entitled. I, I knew a bishop once who said, we, you know, giving all the litigation that's so... Um, prevalent in our culture, he said, we ought to change the, the first line of our national anthem to, oh, say, can you sue? <laughs> and it was a sad commentary on that sort of thing. Yes. We compare up. Okay. Yes. Okay, going up and upward, upwardly mobile. And yes, wanting more and more. Yes. Yeah. And, yes. We have so much. That's right. Yes. Yeah. When you when you divest yourselves, um, you know, uh, it it becomes so much. Yeah, there's more to be grateful for. And when we're surrounded by things, how are we ever grateful? Because everything's so accessible. Um, it's that's really true. Um, the Buddhists believe in a, you know, or, or, or understand this concept of tana, which is an addiction to thirst. That we want more and more and more. The more we have, the more we want. There was a wonderful little parable or a little story. Do you remember that story about the fisherman who catches the magic fish and the fish pleads with him to let him go? And, and he, he says, if you do, I'll give you anything you ask for. And so he says, she just lets him go. And he goes back, and his wife, of course, it's the wife who's like such a shrew in this story. She says, go back and ask him for a new house. We need a new house. How could you let him go with that? So he calls to the fish and asks for a new house. And they get a new house, and she's happy for a while. And then she's, she sees, again, what, what more could we have? So she sends him back, you know, ask for a mansion, and then a castle. And, you know, it keeps uh, ramping up and up and up until finally she says, ask him to be God. And the fish has had it by then and puts him back in the little shack. The fisherman's happy and the wife isn't, and that's the end of the story. I remember reading that as a child and how striking that was to me, that you could be on this constant cycle of wanting more and more and more, and then the more you have, the more you become discontent. Of course, our whole advertising... Um, and consumer culture is based on that. Jesus warned of having so much that we fail to recognize the grace of God and simple things around us, as you're saying. As he said, behold the lilies of the field, the birds of the air, how your father cares for them. Look at this rose, you know, look at that. Can you think of anything more exquisite, you know? The beauty of that, I mean, and, and yet we constantly want more and more and more. So once again, I invite you to go back to your family. Name one thing for which you're grateful for in your family. Okay, and again, let's just buzz a little bit with your neighbor, just real quickly. One thing you're thankful for. Anybody want to share with us what you heard? Somebody else say they were grateful for? Or you're grateful for, or? Yes. Oh. Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. The empty nester and seeing the reciprocal nature of children coming back and and keeping up communications is a wonderful thing to be thankful for. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Anything else? Okay. Okay, seeing them, watching your children raise children. Yeah, which has got great, you know, benefits, I think. I, I remember hearing a story about a father changing his 
baby's diapers and the baby's squirming around and crying and everything and the father's singing something. The mother's not sure what he's doing. She, she comes up to the door and she hears him singing, someday I hope you have children someday. <laughs> But there is that gratification of seeing uh, the birds leave the nest, you know, and that they become interesting, wonderful human beings, and and what a what a grateful thing that is. And I think for teachers and those of you in pastor work too, I mean, isn't that the same sort of thing? Is to see growth, you know, in our in our family of origin, our nuclear families, our extended families, our families of faith. Um, the garden is a place of abundance. You know, we look at the harvest as an occasion uh, for giving thanks. And, um, you know, I, it sets a wonderful place to, to look at grace. Grace and gratitude share the same root word. Karl Barth, um, the theologian, wrote that grace and gratitude belong together like heaven and earth. Grace evokes gratitude like the voice of an echo. Gratitude follows grace like, um, like lightning, like thunder lightning. The Eucharist is a celebration of thanksgiving. That's the word is what it, you know, what it means is give thanks. Bringing our gifts to the table, celebrating the presence of Christ among us. Uh, Robert Emmons um, conducted the first, I think, major scientific study on the benefits of gratitude. Uh, and in his study, he notes that grateful people experience higher levels of positive emotions, such as joy, enthusiasm, love, optimism, and happiness. Um, and he, he names a number of benefits that surfaced in his study. You know, this isn't just anecdotal, but that, um, you know, these first five on this list, and you have them on your handout, the ability to cope more effectively with everyday stress, grateful people are more resilient, uh, gratitude promotes recovery from illness. Uh, grateful people have increased feelings of connecti connectedness, and they also have improved relationships. Uh, Henry Nouwen, um, the late Henry Nouwen once wrote that it's impossible to be simultaneously resentful and grateful. You know, try it. You can't do it. You cannot be resentful and grateful at the same time. There's also that sense of gratitude then attunes us to what we have versus what we wish we had. Um, it diminishes then the unhappiness that comes with that constant thirst or the self-serving demands of entitlement. Uh, was, you know, we, we're such an, a, a rich, wealthy nation. We have so much. And Mother Teresa once called us the most impoverished country in the world because we're so unhappy. <laughs> You know, why? Because we don't seem to be grateful for, and I think it really is the small things. This time actually could be a great time of grace for us as a nation. The scarcity, you know, the same people are now eating at home more, you know, duh. You know, we're kind of looking at what we have versus having more and more and more. If we use it well, it doesn't necessarily, isn't a given necessarily. Uh, gratitude opens us up to generosity. And, as, uh, and generous people as role models and sources of inspiration. When my mother, um, the last few years of her life, she was in a nursing home. Um, and I'm sure many of you have known what this is like, the pain of watching your parent disappear in little increments. Um, she had a stroke after my dad died and she lost her ability to walk and then she just kept kind of going downhill. Although, you know, happily she remembered all of us at the very end. But I used to bring her communion um, at the nursing home and I, because uh, I was working at Pax Christi at the time and one of the people at the, at the nursing home said, well, you know, there's no Catholic presence here. I mean, nobody's bringing communion to the other Catholic residents. Do you think you could arrange for your parish to do this? So we did. We set up a communion ministry um, at, at Heritage. And so I would, the days that I would go to see mom, I would bring communion to my five other residents. And some days was, um, it was very, very hard. You know, either mom was kind of out of it, um, or it was just painful to see her slipping away. Or, you know, some of the other residents, you just watch them, you know, day after day, um, also slipping away. So I saved Amelia for last. 
because Amelia was always my little bright light. Amelia was in uh, the home not because she had any kind of a dementia or anything, but she had suffered some illness that kept her bedridden. And she was always just beautifully coiffed. She had white hair, and, and her grandchildren brought her bed jackets and everything. She always looked so nice. And they put their pictures up on the ceiling so she could look at them. And, and um, one day I was, was there, and I was just not in the mood. <laughs> you know, it was just hard, hard day. And I was distracted, and I walked down the hall. And before I knew it, I was, had passed Amelia's house, bless you, um, house, her room. And I was all the way at the end of the hall and realized, you know, and walked back. And when I got in the room, she said to me, oh, I prayed you'd come back. So right there, I thought, you know, oh, my God, you know, she can't even get up to call me. And um, so we, we prayed together. I always prayed in Our Father with them. An interesting thing, any of you that have do this sort of ministry know, no matter how much dementia people suffer, they never forget that prayer. It's just in the heart. Talk about learning by heart. It's just beautiful. So we'd pray that, and I gave her communion. We had a little time of silence, and then we ta chatted for a little bit. And I was just feeling my heart lighten more and more the more I was with her. And then right before I left, she, she looked at me very closely and said, she said, no, I never noticed before how brown your eyes are. I like them. Oh, I felt so good. You know, and I got in my car, and I pulled out onto the highway, and when that guy came and cut me off, I thought, no problem. No problem, because I have beautiful brown eyes. <laughs> I felt that day, like that was the day I finally understood what it means to share Eucharist. That, uh, and I left there wondering, who gave Jesus to who? Because what she gave me that day, and Amelia has since died, but I still hold her so much in my heart. Every time I look in the mirror and look at my own eyes, she gave me a gift of gratitude for who I am. She was generous, and she allowed me to be generous. That's what, what generosity does. It does open up a capacity in us, and gratitude is one of the greatest entrees into that. There's also a sense of God's goodness that gets brought into sharper vision. We start to notice more, to pay attention, to listen, to look around. There's an attentiveness to grace. And attentiveness is a contemplative spiritual practice that, again, could take a whole day to just talk about. Uh, and it's one that, you know, as we said earlier, we're so busy. We're missing everything. You know, as Alice Walker says so beautifully in The Color Purple, I think it pisses God off if we walk by the color purple in a field somewhere and don't stop to notice. You know, what, what is that about, that we have all of this beauty and we're too busy to notice? And then gratitude, as Emmons says in his study, gratitude is always focused on others. And so what it does for us is it's, Cultivating a spiritual practice of gratitude helps us expand our world views and it expands our capacity for compassion. Um, and compassion, the sharing of compassion is something that all religious traditions share in common. They all call for the, some kind of golden rule of being loving and graceful towards one another. So how then do we cultivate gratitude as a spiritual practice in our own lives and then in uh, family life, particularly with children? I think parents have to be attentive not to give in to every demand for instant gratification and help, uh, and help children to do the same thing. Uh, we're in a season where we're asked to abstain. You know? And you know, some of us maybe grew up in, in situations where we've been around people that give up something for Lent, and really by the fifth mo you know, week, you're saying, please, please smoke your cigarette. You're driving me crazy, you know. It's not how much it hurts us, but that the, the idea of fasting during the season of Lent makes the festival of Easter, which isn't just Sunday morning, but the entire season, a celebration of feasting. Did you know it's forbidden in the church to fast during the Easter season? A Jesuit told me that years ago. I never knew that. 
Um, and I don't even I don't know where to find that, but maybe he, maybe Vince made that up. But I don't think so. It it is so keeping with the season. It's a festival, and so we share. We do, not indulging in gluttony, but what the the Lenten fast does ideally is attune us to the beauties and the richness of the Garden uh, of Easter joy and resurrection. When we express our appreciation for someone in our family or circle of friends on a spiritual basis, we are practicing and cultivating gratitude. This just isn't about what they do, but who they are. Adolescents are especially in need of this. It's such a tender time. Um, you know, when you, when you say to a young person, you're a really good friend. You know, I noticed that about it. You, or you, you listen so well, or, or you're so generous, you know. You watch people when you share a compliment with them. Sometimes they don't know what to do. Um, oh, so, oh, no, you know, and we tend to argue. Oh, no, me, no, no, you know. Uh, and when somebody pays you a compliment, don't argue with them like they're the biggest idiot in the world. Well, I'm sorry. I guess I've really got a bad judge of character. But to say thank you, just say thank you and take it in. If you have beautiful blue eyes, brown eyes, whatever it is, that's what, what you have been given, and that's what someone has recognized in you. Um, it's so it's <clears throat> critical for children and adolescents because they, so, they see themselves as deficient. Uh, when you look at the, the sadness of anorexia nervosa as a disease, it's not that the person wants to lose weight, it's that they want to disappear. It's, a, it's an insidiously horrible disease. Um, and look at all the people that are suffering from that. So um, when, we, uh, when we express our appreciation, we're, we're cultivating this. And encouraging children to express their appreciation to others. We used to have to write thank you notes right after Christmas, uh, which we hated. <laughs> you know, we wanted to play with our toys. And it's like, how do you thank you know, grandma for this horribly ugly sweater? But I'm very glad that, that my parents required that of us because what it cultivated in me was that practice of writing to people, acknowledging them. Um, you know, even if it's an email, even though handwritten means so much. Because first of all, you get something in the mail, it's like, oh my God, it's not a bill. You know, it's <laughs> somebody actually wrote my name out. Um, that it's really important that we do that. Also, don't push, just like we don't push phony expressions of forgiveness, Forcing children to say thank you when they're not grateful really doesn't work, you know, and we do it all the time. I mean, it may be a way to, you know, encourage children to consider how they're thankful. Um, I think, I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, thank ground, you know, thank grandma, she had a nice dinner for us, thank you, you know, but then talk about it afterwards, encourage parents to do that. Why are we grateful? What did it take for this meal to be put in place? Uh, for this gift to be bought and wrapped and sent to you. you know? There's so much we take for granted, and that helps to counter some of that entitlement. Um, and then, do you uh, think back to that little family quiz I asked? How many of you take time to do something every day that you enjoy? Uh, everybody should have stood up, right? <laughs> uh, we often say, I'm going to do that someday when I have time. Uh, but there is something we can do every day, um, is to recognize uh, God's gift in our life. I'm going to go into this in a little bit. I have another prayer I want to show you. Um, tell stories of gratitude and let these come naturally rather than forcing them. Uh, and give thanks for something every day by writing it down or giving it some time for reflection. Um, Sarah von Brethnock's um, Simple Abundance is a wonderful, she has a wonderful uh, gratitude journal that is a terrific spiritual exercise. Thanksgiving is one of the forms of Christian prayer, and it should be something we um, practice on a regular basis. Now, all of this um, gets down to this question, though, of what I'm going to do, and what I think I should do, and what I'm actually going to be able to do. Uh, that question, I wish I had more time for. What comes to mind? Just throw some of my answers out. Writing? Okay. Prayer. Prayer? Myself? Okay. Sewing? Okay. Friends? All right. Exercise? All right. Travel? Okay. Sleep? Okay. 
Yeah, you ask a group of uh, young moms, you know, moms groups, they will, in, as a body, rise up and say sleep. Uh, I ask this question a lot on retreats. Uh, rarely do people say, God, I wish I had more time to work, you know, go to my job and, you know. Uh, <laughs> It seems to be that even though work itself is a beautiful thing, you know, we made it into something so dreary. But uh, when you look at what we need to create a garden, gardens take time and attention. And those are two resources that seem to be in very short supply in families, in marriages today. Uh, I once heard that time is the greatest deficit in family life today. I know, of any resource. And when, when I ask, uh, catechetical pastoral leaders, what they struggle with when they're working with families, inevitably they will name time. Families are too stretched, they have too much going on, they're all going in different directions, they don't know how to sit down together, you know. It is just constant running, running, running. There are other resource issues that surface um, too in this whole thing, but all of this, you know, gratitude, forgiveness, um, you know, storytelling, ritual, they do take time and they take attentiveness, but so does the spiritual life. To be a disciple means to be disciplined, you know, and if you know somebody who's disciplined, they're a disciple, you know, they're, they're a disciple mus or disciplined musician or, or athlete or whatever, they take time, don't they? And they practice, practice, practice. And so it does take, it's not something that we just pick up whenever, you know, the mood hits us. But when you look at the great saints and mystics, they didn't pray when they felt like it. They made it part of their daily routine. Um, and there is a lot that can be lost to regret over time that we have lost or wasted or squandered on things that don't matter. I've been writing a book on the spirituality of time for three years, and my problem is I don't have any time to write it. <laughs> Um, but I, so I've been thinking about this for so long, what, what a spiritual issue time is for us. Anna Quinlan wrote a wonderful column about being, uh, you know, dealing with her regrets as an empty nest mother. And she says, the biggest mistake I made is the one that most of us make. I did not live in the moment enough. This is particularly clear now that the moment is gone, captured only in photographs. There is one picture of the three of them sitting in the grass on a quilt in the shadow of the swing set on a summer day, ages six, four, and one. And I wish I could remember what we ate and what we talked about and how they sounded and how they looked when they slept at night. I wish I had not been in such a hurry to get on to the next thing, dinner, bath, book, bed. I wish I had treasured the doing a little more and the getting it done a little less. Even today, I'm not sure what worked and what didn't, what was me and what was simply life. When they were very small, I suppose I thought someday they would become who they were because of what I'd done. Now I suspect they simply grew into their true selves because they demanded in a thousand ways that I back off and let them be. The book said to be relaxed, and I was often tense, matter of fact, and I was sometime over the top. And look how it all turned out. I wound up with the three people I like best in the world who have done more than anyone to excavate my essential humanity. That's what the books never told me. I was bound and determined to learn from the experts. It just took me a while to figure out who the experts were. I love that. My sister Corinne sent that to me. Anna Quinlan? Um, you know, I don't even know. It was one of those emails that I got from... So. If you, um, if you want to email me, my email is kmhendrix11 at gmail.com, and I can, I can send you the whole article if you want. Okay. Uh, on our trip around the country, Ron and I had the luxury of time. The biggest decision we had to make each day was what to eat. It was fabulous. This is a picture in St. Louis of the botanical gardens in St. Louis. That my, my cousins live in St. Louis and they gave us a t tickets to the gardens. And um, we spent all morning there wandering around. Ron took, you know, a thousand pictures. <laughs> and I sat and just watched these are glass um, 
sculptures floating in the water and then we'd get up and wander around a little bit more. And um, in my journal, I wrote about the wandering that allowed us to see the garden and for Ron to take the pictures that he did. If we had rushed around trying to see everything, we would have ended up seeing nothing. Uh, that was the hardest thing that we tried to get impart to people, you know, was that we're not, we don't expect to see everything on this trip. What we came um, to realize early on was that what we would see each day would be enough. And it turned out to be true. I have very few regrets about our time on the road, precisely because we did take time, literally, to stop and look around and smell the roses. Doing so brought to mind the loveliness of the garden at Ivy Lane. That was a place I think that becomes so special in my memory because we never rushed there. We ate leisurely meals on the porch. We lazed around on the, uh, what my parents called the bar-wise chairs that eventually got so deteriorated from us jumping up and down on them that they just fell apart and then all we had was the, the frame which we still used as toys. We had endless rounds of kick the can in the backyard and just time to lie in the grass and watch the stars come up. You know, that sort of thing sounds like Andy Griffith and, you know, we all say, geez, when can I have a life like that? You know? Well, we're never going to have it if we don't claim it. And, and it doesn't mean that we have to take off uh, for a whole year, but there are days, every day we could take some time Spirituality in the home, as in all other aspects of life, does not thrive in a hothouse environment. It needs time and space for wandering, for rest, for being. I remember on summer evenings um, when we would be, you know, the neighbors would all be in our yard playing kick the can or hide and seek or whatever. And I remember mom coming out and standing and hand watering her roses. And it just, as I look back on that, I think it was, because my mother was a real active woman. She was always having, you know, millions of people over for meals, and she was involved in all sorts of volunteer things. I look back on it, and I think this was mom's moment of contemplation during the day. She would stand there and just water the roses while we ran around. And um, nothing else was required. I'm sure it just warmed her heart to see those flowers come to life. And it continues to be an image to me and a reminder to just be. This is one of my favorite pictures from the trip. <laughs> it's taken up in the Adirondacks. Isn't that lovely? Don't you wish you were that guy? <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things that I realized on the trip, we've been asked a lot about, well, what did you learn? What did you do? What was your favorite place? One of the things that I, I keep thinking about were two words from the Bible that if you don't pay attention to them, you totally miss. Jesus withdrew. Jesus withdrew. Jesus withdrew. He withdrew sometimes to the desert. Sometimes he withdrew with friends for a meal. But he drew away from the center of the action to the periphery. I'm really beginning to value that understanding that Jesus is a model for us as he withdraws for times of sustenance and renewal. Sometimes it's to a quiet place. Other times it's to meals with friends who revive his spirit with food and conversation. The call to Sabbath is one of deep memory. The commandment is remember to keep holy the Sabbath. Remember. And in you know, the times in which it was given to these people, a time when they were escaping from slavery, Imagine what this was a gift, you know, sort of gift it was for them. A whole day abstaining from work, you know, from any labor where they just were allowed to be. Not to do anything, not to achieve anything, not to acquire anything. Sabbath is a time and a place of sanctuary in which, which we disconnect from the frenzy of consumption and accomplishment. I think we as a nation need to withdraw every day for a period of time from all the stuff we're plugged into. Phones, internet, texting, whatever, because we're constantly in touch with bad news. And what that's doing is skewing our vision of the world. 
which Jesus is saying is full of good news if we take time to look around. Uh, but we can't do that if we're rushing around. Reclaiming Sabbath as a family practice is one of the most important things we can do to restore spiritual balance and allow for the expansion of grace in our homes and in our hearts. And again, this may not be doable for people that have, you know, we have two jobs, we have kids going to sports, we have, you know, all sorts of things that maybe a parent we're taking care of who's ill or a child with special needs. Uh, whatever it is, you know, we have to figure out then how do we do this on a daily basis that in some ways refreshes our heart. And it doesn't mean that it's just, you know, it's got to be all day long. Father Thomas Keating says just set aside 20 minutes and just show up. You know? And maybe it's only five. One of the, my favorite spiritual practices, and I've been doing this for several years, I wrote about it in my book on prayer for, for parents, um, and it's becoming to, to mean more and more to me. It's a prayer I call the fist prayer, because um, you can use your hand to count off, F-S-S-S-T. It's a prayer of the senses, that every day, at the end of the day, I take an inventory. The first is F for a feeling. What did I feel physically today? I love this jacket, it's real soft, so that's my F feeling for today. But the feel of somebody hugging you, the feel of a wind, you know, on your face, things that you might not otherwise stop to notice. If your feet are cold and putting on a really soft pair of warm socks, that's a great one, one of my favorites. Um, S for sound, what did I hear today? A favorite song on the radio, somebody laughing even the sound of silence. Uh, the, th the third one, S for sight, something I saw, flower, somebody's beautiful brown eyes, you know? uh, my spouse smiling at me across the table. The fourth one could sometimes be the hardest one to recall, a smell. Um, I stayed in Brookline last night and went for a walk. Just the smells of the food up and down the, oh my lord, that was wonderful. <laughs> and then, um, because smell is the greatest memory trigger that we have of all of our senses. And then the last one is taste. Something I actually tasted and didn't inhale. You know, stuffed into my face as I'm, you know, going off to something else. But savoring, you know, savoring that piece of chocolate or whatever. The beauty of this prayer to me, if you make it a constant practice, first of all, it's very simple so you can teach little children can learn this prayer. It's something that doesn't take a huge investment of time. Uh, it's a way to calm yourself at the end of a day if you're really anxious. I use it in the middle of the night when I can't sleep. And inevitably, I fall asleep before I've gotten to the last piece. Um, it also attunes us to the present moment. When you start practicing it, you start to become aware as you're collecting it. It's like, oh, there's, like I said, I was in Brookline and I thought, there's my smell for tonight. And um, recently I discovered another benefit to this, is that when I pray this prayer, I often am led to praying for people that have harsh feelings. Maybe, you know, as I'm praying in Thanksgiving for a tender touch, uh, that I have felt that day, I'm able to pray for a person who has had a harsh touch, someone who's been slapped or battered, you know. Uh, praying for the person, you know, who, um, when I was in, uh, when we were in Atlantic City, and I think of the man that I saw who had no legs sitting on the boardwalk, you know, and what it felt like for him that he could never look directly into somebody's eyes. He always had to look up. You know? And so it becomes a prayer that starts to expand our sense of compassion and our connectedness to one another. Um, so, to end with, um, what kind of Sabbath uh, time does your family share? Do you share? How might you two stop to smell the roses on a more regular basis? got some time, Melinda, to do some sharing? Okay. Um, so what I'd like to ask you to do now is maybe you want to reflect on that question or think about which spiritual practice speaks most strongly to you, to your family, maybe to your parish situation. 
what questions do you have or suggestions might you have for other families? So whatever, however you'd like to do this, I'd invite you to go back into your little, you know, sharing with somebody uh, and just talk a little bit, a process a little bit, and then we'll come back together and share some thoughts before we close up. If I could respond to, to both uh, the luxury piece, which I think is very true, and it's, it's ironic that we are, uh, you know, you look at it, we live in a, a society in a time where we have more, more of everything than any future generations. I mean, I'm very grateful that I have a washing machine, you know. And my grandmother, you know, I mean, and I even remember my mom, I mean, she had a ringer down in the basement and she had a big mangle, she used to iron all the sheets and, geez, you know, I haven't picked up an iron. In <laughs> so I know that I have the luxury of time, we have the luxury of resources, and yet I, one of the most um, formative experiences of my life was going and volunteering in a, the Diocese of Prince George in, in Canada, as Barbara said, I worked up in British Columbia and where Ron and I met, and we worked with very, very poor children. Um, they were indigenous people um, who lived on reserves, and the Canadian welfare system makes ours look um, just pitiful in comparison. I mean, they really create a dependency on the government that is horrible, and they have reduced people's lands to such small squares. I remember one of the women that used to come clean the school said, you know, we all used to have gardens. We don't have gardens anymore. And you, the homes were just fraught with alcoholism and violence. I remember, you know, and here I am just out of college, you know, trying to teach. I'm living, you know, grew up in a street called Ivy Lane. And, uh, you know, one of my second graders runs in and says, yeah, my dad nearly shot us last night. He had a rifle. And then, you know, the next thing he's telling me about some TV show. And I'm thinking, I have no experience <laughs> whatsoever with this. What, we were, what is striking to me about that time, and I don't mean to romanticize it, but those children laughed more openly and with more abandon than any children I've ever known and seen. This picture here was taken in Thailand um, when my husband Ron and my daughter were in, went to Nepal for their, um, their track, and that was, uh, you know, something too, I, let's see if I can go back to the slide real early on, but, um, of Anna with the children, uh, they, she, they said the same thing. These people were so, um, they had so little and there was such poverty. Uh, let's see, that's my daughter. Uh, the, the children were just totally fascinated by her blonde hair and they followed her everywhere. <laughs> And what she said was the same thing of how happy they were. Uh, now again, that can be really romanticized and I hear what you're saying. That's why I think we have to give people something small to start with. Because a lot of our spiritual disciplines seem to ask so much. I mean, I know a lot of people have said, I wanna do learn centering prayer, but it's so complex. And you know, then I think we say like, uh, you know, Father Keating, don't pray what you can't, pray what you can. And if all you can manage is a prayer in the car, you know, on the way from here to there, then that's what we do. And then your, your uh, point on social justice is very pertinent. And um, if we had more time, we certainly would go into that. Because I think each of these practices do open us up to a sense of justice. As I said, praying the fist prayer, which sounds, you know, in the beginning for me was just a collection for myself. You know, a happy, happy day that I had with my little fist prayer. But the other, you know, when I was, I, the other night I, I was praying it and it just, all these suffering people came into my mind, you know. When we went on our trip, um, one of the women in our parish gave me, um, she's just, just an incredible woman who has all these, you know, like so many people, just so many things to do with in her own life. But she has time and energy to do all these things for other people. Uh, and she gave me a, uh, a card, and in it was a $20 bill to buy snacks for the road when we left. And then in another envelope, she had $21 bills, and she said, you will meet people along the way who are hurting and just need a little bit, you know, maybe, can you just hand these out so somebody can get a cup of coffee? That made our trip so significant. I handed out Kay's dollars with such care <laughs> because I knew that every person who got them wasn't just given a buck here or there so they could get a cup of coffee and walking off and forgetting them, 
but the man in Atlantic City without any legs, I got down low so I could look him in the face and he didn't have to look up at me and I could just say, God bless you, you know, I hope you, you know. Um, it doesn't fix anything, <laughs> but what it does is expand our compassion, uh, you know, our capacity for compassion. And those are where we have to start with children, you know, and with families, because I think people are overwhelmed. We can easily suffer compassion fatigue. Well, there's so much, so much pain. Where do we even start? And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, my dad taking the vines down from the windows, it wasn't only that light came in, but that we could look out. And I think your point is so well taken. We have to always be in, enfolding into our spiritual practices and discipline ways for people to look outward, to, to expand their capacity to be generous, to be compassionate, to learn the struggles of others, not to feel guilty but to see ourselves in connection with them. So thank you for those points. They're very, very, very good. Well, and I don't mean to say we don't teach our kids to say thank you, because uh, Lord knows I did that enough too. And they're just, you know, but what I began to see is when it's, it's you know, I'm thanking them so that I can get mom off my back, you know, as opposed to genuine gratitude. And what I'm talking about is the cultivation of gratitude. Um, David Stendhal Rost is a nice, um, differentiation between thankfulness and gratitude, whereas thankfulness is, he says, is more targeted on one, you know, more specific areas. And gratitude is kind of this attitude that we walk through life with where we're, we, don't, we don't feel entitled, we don't feel like, um, oh, I need more and more and more, but that what I have is enough. And it really is, uh, you know, that, that idea of grace abound, abounding in my life. Uh, so I think with children, I mean, I think it's important because you're differentiating between manners um, and then this attitude of gratitude. And teaching kids manners is not enough to cultivate gratitude. I think that's the point I'm trying to get across. Is that, and, and part of it is that we can't lecture to them. That's a hard thing. I so wish I could have opened my kids' heads up and said, just thank your grandmother for something, you know, instead of feeling like you're so entitled. But, uh, so I think, again, part of it is modeling. When they see that you practice, you know, I talked about the language of, of forgiveness. I think we also need to cultivate a language of gratitude, you know. And that's what I think, what I, when I talked about my mother, uh, we had to write thank you notes, and I totally believe in thank you notes. I think kids should write thank you notes. I think they, they should sit down and think about things and, and reflect on it. Uh, which is part of good manners. But when mom would say, oh, we have so much to be grateful for. Now, there were times when I hated it when she said that, because I thought, no, I want more. You know, a little kid, you know, you want more and more and more. I want what they have. But what mom practiced was, what we have here now is good, you know. And I think she really had a grateful attitude. And what I began to see was, there is abundance, you know. There's abundant joy in this. And I think we are doing our children a disservice, as I said, by giving them so much that they can't even see what's around them. They're drowning in all this stuff. I used to put away half of my kids' toys up in the closet. I did this for my own sanity. But after a while, I began to see, first of all, I got rid of a lot of clutter. But then I'd take them down after you know, three or four months, they thought they had a brand new toys. I thought, boy, am I smart, you know? <laughs> but they began also to see, it's interesting how both of them now as adults are saying, oh, we need less. We want to live with less. We would like a simple life. What they are feeding back to us now is the best times in our lives were not the things when we were running around like crazy, but the time we spent together. Both of them are saying that to us, time the time together. So I don't know whether that answers that to your satisfaction, but I, th I think it's a both and. I think you can teach them certainly the manners, but the cultivation of gratitude is like constantly tilling the soil. It's like working the soil and constantly tilling it through our language, through our attitudes, and mostly our modeling. It's going to be through our modeling, you know. I wonder about our parishes. 
what sort of attitudes we share in our parishes. When you go in and that message week after week is we're having a fundraiser and we need more money. You know, I once knew a pastor who turned out all the lights one Sunday so the people would know what it was going to be like if they didn't pony up. And, you know, it did not work well for him. <laughs> people were mad. It was like, why, you know, instead of saying we have so much, we are so grateful to you, we're so grateful that you could be here every Sunday. When's the last time someone said that to you when you walked into church? You know? And so and we're bombarded in our culture with give more, do more, do this, do that, you know, instead of thank you so much. One of the questions I ask um, parish people is if they have this dilemma where they go home at night and say, um, you know, these are parish staff people, I can't. I can't get any rest. I mean, people are calling me all the time to thank me for the great job I'm doing at the church. You know? And everybody laughs, like, what? Yeah, that would be absurd. You know? <laughs> When's the last time you thought to thank somebody genuinely? Send them a note, you know? One of the things I was very aware of when we were on the road was people that are cleaning up after us. It's a great exercise for children. How many people in the course of the day clean up after you? Who takes away your trash? You know, who sweeps the streets? Who plows the snow? You know, um, we would leave tips, you know, in the hotels, and sometimes maids would write. So, you know, the housekeepers would write us these lovely notes. Thank you so much. I'd feel terrible. It was like two bucks, but somebody thought to notice. That, that they came in and they cleaned, and so we would often write them, thank you, thank you for doing this for us. So it's a whole attitude. I have one prayer I'd like to end with. And then... Thank you, thank you. Well, I have a reading from Colossians. It's, it's from the third chapter of Colossians, verses 12 through 17, uh, that I'd like to end with, because I think Paul, you know, it's so summed up in this what family spirituality is about. So I'd encourage you to just put down your pencils and close your eyes if you feel comfortable and let these words sink deep into your, the soil of your soul because there's so much beautiful language here about how to live uh, and cultivate a garden of grace. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, heartfelt compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if one has a grievance against another. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must do. And over all these put on love, that is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of Christ control your hearts, the peace into which you were also called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as in all wisdom you teach and admonish one another, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kathy, for the inspiration and the affirmation of what we're already doing and for deepening our understanding of these spiritual practices. One more hand, thank you very much.